Good afternoon, members. Can we all come to um, order, please? First item on our agenda this afternoon, questions to the First Minister. Question one, Russell George. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Will the First Minister make a statement on ambulance response times? Yes, the Welsh Ambulance Service continues to exceed the national target to respond to immediately life-threatening or red calls within eight minutes. In August, 74.4% of red calls received a response within eight minutes, with a median response time of just over five minutes. Uh, thank you for your answer, First Minister. Back in March, I questioned the Cabinet Secretary for Health on ambulance response times in Paris, following delays at the time it takes for an ambulance to arrive following a 999 call. And this has been partly attributed to ambulances waiting outside hospitals to transfer patients into the care of hospital staff. In a letter to me on the 24th of July, the Chief Exec of the Welsh Ambulance uh, Trust confirmed that the average ambulance handover times for January to June of this year was nine minutes for Telford, 26 minutes for Shrewsbury, and a shocking one hour and two minutes for Wraxham uh, Myler. I would be grateful if you could provide details about what you're doing to improve the handover time at Wraxham Myler, which of course is under the direct control of Welsh Government, to prevent further delays uh, to ambulance response times for the residents of Montgomeryshire. Well, there are, there are obviously issues as well in the English hospitals as well, and there will be times when demand uh, is particularly acute. So what I can tell him, though, in terms of uh, POWIS in August, 71.2% of red calls received a response within eight minutes. That's above the national target of 65% for the fourth consecutive month. The typical response time for that type of call was around four minutes and eight seconds, the fastest typical response time in Wales uh, that, uh, that month. Uh, and finally, whilst no formal time target is in place for amber calls, uh, the typical response to an amber calling power was 20 minutes and 17 seconds in January, again, better than the national average of 24 minutes and 19 seconds. Thank you. Three Diolch yn dirpio lywyd. Yn un sôn fel arfer am ymateb ambulans i bobl sydd a salwch corfforol. Ond wrth gwrs, mae'n y bobl sydd ag anghenion y salwch meddyliol hefyd, a does ganddo ni ddim tima y penodol sy'n ymateb i alwadau iechyd meddwl. Rwy'n yn Sweden, yn Stockholm yn benodol, oherwydd y nifer uchel o hunanladiadau, mae yna dîm arbennig wedi cael eu sefydlu, tîm ymateb bris seiciau trydol. Rwy'n o ystyried yr angen sydd yna am ymateb bris i bobl sydd ag anhwylder y ciwt meddwl neu yr heini sydd mewn perig o, o, o hunanladiad. Ydych chi fel prif yn ei dod yn cytuno y dyla y gwasanaeth ambulans yn Nghymru fod yn edrych ar y bosibilrwydd o greu tîm bris iechyd meddwl neu dimau bris iechyd meddwl hefyd yn Nghymru. Yn uh, syniad ddiddorol, uh, ac wrth gwrs, ni wedi canolbwyntio ar cams, yn dwi'n gwrs dim yn cynnwys um, oedolion. Uh, ond mae fi'n wedi weld, mae rhywun ar rhywf a thô greisio synglyn a'i iechyd uh, meddwl. Wel, dwi'n ddim yn teddu meddwl am ambulance neu'r ysbyty uh, yn un ar lle cyn dai uh, i fynd. Ond uh, mwna'r rhywbeth, dwi'n cynnwys yn ddiddorol, werth uh, edrych arno, a, a gofynna i'r um, uh, ysgrifen y cabinet, ysgrifen i'n ôl at y uh, aelod. First Minister, um, there has been a massive increase in demand for ambulances, up around 128% over the last two decades. Um, but the new clinical response model is supposed to ensure that those in the most need get the fastest response, uh, be that a fully crewed ambulance or a rapid response paramedic. However, last year, 16% of red calls took longer than 10 minutes, and 68 people waited more than half an hour for an emergency response. So, First Minister, do you agree that this is unacceptable, and will you outline the actions your government will take to reduce the number of red calls taking more than 10 minutes and eliminate the number of calls taking over half an hour to respond? Thank you. Uh, well, I'd be very disappointed if calls took over half an hour to respond on, onto a red call. Uh, as far as red calls are concerned, uh, we are well above target, not 100%, uh, I understand that, but we're well above target in terms of ambulances reaching uh, people when they are needed. There has been uh, an issue that's been raised in terms of amber calls, uh, of, of course. Uh, there are some patients who continue to wait longer than we would uh, expect, uh, and I know that the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Social Services has commissioned the Chief Ambulance Services Commissioner to look at the AMBER category, to conduct a clinically-led review of the AMBER uh, category. That does include serious but not life-threatening uh, calls, well, about almost two-thirds of the call volume, actually, of the Welsh Ambulance Service. Uh, and I know that the Cabinet Secretary will update members over the course of the next few weeks. Question two, Julie Morgan. Uh, what plans does the Welsh Government have to support Welsh universities? 
Well, we recognise the importance of a thriving world-class HE sector to the economic and social well-being of Wales. We will continue to provide support, of course, to the sector through HEFCO, which, together with our student support reforms, will create a stronger and more sustainable sector in Wales. Um, I thank the First Minister for that response, and I know the First Minister will agree that the continuing uncertainty over Brexit is having a massive impact um, on the university sector. And um, unfortunately, um, uh, Welsh universities saw the biggest drop in the UK in the number of EU applicants between 2017 and 2018. So what help um, can the Welsh Government offer to the universities, which are obviously you know, a crucial part of our economy in Wales, to halt or try to reverse this uh, downward trend of um, EU students coming to Welsh universities? Well, well, I can say that the Cabinet Secretary for Education has announced several additional elements of funding for HEFCO over the next few years, including uh, £6 million in 2017 to 18 to deal with the short-term implications of demographic change and preparation for the implications of uh, Brexit. Uh, we've also allocated £3.5 million to Global Wales II from the European Transition Fund to boost international marketing and links for the HE sector in uh, Wales. And we'll look at further opportunities for the EU Transition Fund to support the sector. Andrew Archie Davis. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. First Minister, clearly the offer isn't strong enough at the moment. When you look at the figures, a 7% drop uh, from non-EU countries and a 10% drop from EU countries coming to Welsh universities, yet England, Scotland and Northern Ireland all saw increases in the number of students enrolling in their universities. Rather than focusing on the money, which is welcome, how are you going to change the offer that actually starts getting more students coming to Wales, such as the other offers that are available in other parts of the United Kingdom are seeing increases in their enrolment numbers? Well, uh, there is an issue, of course, which uh, affects all of the UK, and that's the issue of what's been done with migration. Uh, students feel unwelcome. Uh, certainly, that's something I've picked up many, many times in terms of students from India. They feel unwelcome in the, in the UK. Uh, it's also hugely important that we're able to uh, access the academic staff that are needed in order for universities to be, uh, to be competitive. And ultimately, that's what it's all about. The universities compete in a world market. I've already explained uh, what uh, we are doing in terms of universities in uh, Wales. Uh, and, of course, I very much encourage our universities to uh, sell themselves abroad. Uh, to understand that they operate in a, in a world market uh, and, of course, to make sure that uh, more students come to Wales because of the quality of the University of Education that's available here. Thank you. Claire Griffith. Uh, Dr. well, well, Gyda uh, sawl prifysgol uh, tramor, uh, sydd wedi mynd tramor, er mewn gwerthu'r prifysgolion hynny uh, ar, ar draws y byd. Ond mae sydd holl bwysig, wrth gwrs, yw sicrhau bod y staff academig gyda nhw. Felly, mae'n gallu cynnig y fath o addysg byddwn ni'n mwyn uh, gweld. Ac ar hyn o bryd, beth sy'n peryglu hwnna mwyn a dim byd yw uh, y ffaith bod nhw ddim uh, i gludo'r gwbl yng nglyn â beth bydd status staff academig uh, o uh, o'r Undeb Ewropeaidd a gludydd eraill yn y pendraw. Bydd yna groeso i nhw'n ena, wedi ni'n gweithio'r gwrs bydd y croeso yn talu bod yna. We'll now turn to party leaders' a turn to question the First Minister. Uh, first this afternoon, lead with High Cymru, Leanne Wood. First Minister, do you believe that the Welsh Government has an obligation to implement universal childcare, and I quote, to help address the impacts of poverty and narrow the attainment gap when children start school? Well, we have a very firm manifesto commitment, which we will be taking forward. 
First Minister, that quote that I used was from the leadership bid of the Cabinet Secretary for Children, Older People and Social Care. As I highlighted last week, uh, your Government is slashing school meals provision. and We have Cabinet Secretaries in your Government who say one thing and then do the exact opposite. Now, the Children's Commissioner has lamented your childcare legislation as a large subsidy as a large subsidy for some of Wales's highest earning families that is likely to reinforce inequalities. First Minister, you continue to turn your back on the pol politics of progress in favour of the politics of poverty. Do you accept that your regressive childcare offer is likely to reinforce inequality, or is it your view that the Children's Commissioner is wrong? Well, two things. Let's kill this myth, first of all, that somehow the uh, free school meal provision in Wales is worse than in England. It isn't. There are 3,000 more children who will receive free school meals as a result of we are doing what we are doing as a government. An extra £10 million has been put into the budget in order for that to, uh, to happen. So this idea that somehow school meal provision is being slashed is simply untrue. It's simply untrue. Uh, I've already given the, uh, the figures in terms of the finances and in terms of the children who will be affected. Uh, we put forward uh, a, a radical and innovative plan to help working parents. That's what the, 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 the offer is for, for working parents, because we know uh, how difficult it can be for people to, to, to go back into work with the costs of childcare, and this is what this is designed to do, to help those people who want to get to work, to remove a barrier to employment, uh, and to provide the childcare that people need in, uh, at, at a time uh, when uh, they need that help in order to move back into the world of employment. That's what the scheme is designed to do. Just like your school meals policy, with this, children will lose out, parents will lose out, and in particular, those who are struggling the most, those who are struggling the most will lose out as a result of your childcare legislation. Now, studies from Ireland to Australia to here in Wales shows that one of the biggest barriers for people seeking work is access to high quality childcare, and it's those very people the people who are looking for work or those in education or in training that your policy will exclude from childcare support. So, First Minister, this is a regressive policy. You'll be able to get free childcare if you were a couple earning £200,000, but if you're a struggling parent trying to get back into work or into training, you will be denied such support. How is this compatible with your supposed socialist values, First Minister? Again, I come back to the point I made, which she didn't seem to have picked up on, which is this. That when it comes to free school meals, the offer we put on the, uh, on, on the uh, table it means £10 million more a year, and 3,000 more children will receive free school meals. I don't see how that's slashing free school meals. Uh, let's make that absolutely clear uh, now. Uh, secondly, there is the pay scheme, of course, that helps people get back into, uh, into work. But she seems to contradict herself. On the one hand, she says it should be a universal scheme. Then she says it should be a scheme to help people get back into work. This is what it's designed to do in order to help people get back into work and to offset the costs of childcare they that otherwise have to pay, which makes it less attractive to go into work. Now, if that's what she's saying we should be doing, we are doing it, and we will take forward our manifesto offer on, and deliver the most generous childcare offer anywhere in the UK. Yeah. Leader of the Opposition, Paul Davis. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, uh, Deputy <laughs> Presiding Officer. First Minister, are you ashamed of the A&E waiting times at Wrexham, Myler and Asputty Gland Cloyd Hospitals, which were the worst ever on record published this month? They must improve, there's no question about that. But if we see uh, performances elsewhere in the NHS, uh, we see that A&E provision is, uh, is improving. But clearly, uh, there is a challenge that uh, Bessie Cadwallader must meet in order to reduce the waiting times of those hospitals. Well, First Minister, this is a health board that has been under direct Welsh yeah. control for almost yeah. three and a half years. Yeah. What is there to show for your staged, improved and transformation plans? Well, the record speaks for itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 1,900 patients waited longer than 12 hours at A&E services in North Wales. This is more than all the other health boards combined. This summer, more than 5,000 hours were lost because ambulances were delayed handing over patients at North Wales hospitals. In the last 12 months, 26,000 patient safety <laughs> incidents were recorded, 10,000 more than in Cardiff. 233 of these have been severe incidents, more than double those in Cardiff. 
In the last three years, the Health Board has overspent by £88 million and has more than 2,000 patients waiting over a year for treatment. These are shocking statistics, and behind these figures are real people who are suffering as a result of your sheer incompetence to help this Health Board to improve. For three years, you have been responsible for these services and have set benchmarks to see this Health Board improve. You are clearly failing the people of North Wales. So can you now tell us what you and your government are going to do about this? What specific measures are you now going to take to start addressing this very serious situation? Yeah, yeah. Well, we acknowledge performance on those two sites is unacceptable. That's the first thing to, uh, to say. It's a reflection of pressures and demands on hard-working staff. I've said that I expect the Board to put into place uh, meaningful actions to deal with this. Now, what have we done? Well, the Board, with £1.5 million worth of support from Welsh Government, has put in place arrangements to target improvements and actions in respect of the unscheduled care system in the North. We've also provided £6.8 million earlier this year to strengthen the Health Board's operational capacity at each of the three main hospitals in the North. And that package of support is intended to enable the Health Board to increase its understanding of local challenges and make effective decisions to support immediate improvement. The NHS Wales Delivery Unit is also working at the Wrexham Milo site to support local performance management. Now, as I said, whilst the performance generally is unacceptable, the typical wait in BCU for patients to be seen, assessed and treated or discharged was two hours 48 minutes in August. Now, given the specific concern, uh, which has been raised in fairness, about the August figures, a 90-day improvement cycle has been put in place and will be a point of focus for the board and clinical teams across the north. We will review the board's 90-day plan and decide whether any additional targeted support is required as a matter of urgency. First Minister, the people of North Wales is in this position as a result of consistent <laughs> underfunding downgrading and neglect on yes. behalf of your Welsh yes. Government. Your sheer incompetence to lead this Health Board to an improved state is having huge consequences for the people of North Wales and the staff that work tirelessly to deliver their care. The people of North Wales deserve a safe and sustainable health service. Clearly, you have failed. So here's your chance, First Minister. Before you leave, will you now take this opportunity to apologise yeah, to the yeah. people of North Wales who you have so badly let down? Yeah, yeah. Well, first of all, these are two issues at two hospitals which have emerged in August that must be dealt with. He cannot surely stand there and say that austerity has nothing to do with this. When Northern Ireland had a billion pounds given to it, a substantial amount of which was for e health and education, which drove, I know it's painful, I know it's painful, was given to health and education that drove a coach and horses through the Barnet formula, where were the Welsh Conservatives? Mute, silent, indifferent. Let me tell him he tries to paint a picture of the north of Wales as, as neglected. It was my great pleasure last week to go to a spatty glancloid and to open the cernic. It was a tremendous... Whose fault is that? Is it my fault that the cernic's been opened, apparently? There we are. A sub-regional neonatal intensive care unit. Opened, I remind the party opposite, because I commissioned a report to see whether it would be sustainable to place such um, a unit can you in the calm north down, of Wales. Can you As a result of... All calm down, please, and listen to what the First Minister has to say. You asked the, your leader asked the question. I'm addressing members on the benches to my right. Your leader asked a question. We need to hear the answer from the First Minister without any help from anybody else. Thank you. As a result of that report... As a result of the action taken by a Welsh Labour government, there will now be many, many mothers in the north of Wales who will be able to have their babies safely and looked after safely in North Wales rather than having to travel to Liverpool. He may talk, we deliver. Thank you. Leader of the UKIP group, Gareth Bennett. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. First Minister. Which of the following decisions do you think that Natural Resources Wales can be proudest of? Is it the dumping of 300,000 tonnes of nuclear mud approximately one mile from Cardiff Bay? Or is it giving a licence for a biomass incinerator which neighbours residential properties in Barry Dock? 
Or finally, is it refusing to sell timber from public woodland at market value, potentially fleecing the Welsh taxpayer of £1 million? Well, the first two issues are operational matters in terms of permitting. This, the third issue is uh, a matter which has been well explored and is not acceptable. Uh, clearly, uh, a lack of competence was exhibited uh, by NRW to have oral contracts. Whilst they may be technically legally valid, is not wise, because it's much better to have things uh, written down. Uh, that's been explored, and rightly so, uh, by the Public Accounts uh, Committee. But may, may I remind him that his party are not exactly the best party to lecture on the environment. Uh, this is a party, as far as I can, uh, can see, have no interest in the environment at all, uh, and who wanted to take us out of the European Union, which was singularly responsible for raising Britain's standards, which were so appalling when it came to the environment, particularly in the 70s and 80s. There was one river, I believe the River Irwell in Salford, that at one time would catch fire if you threw a match, a lit match into it. It was the European Union that dragged Britain out of the gutter when it came to its environmental standards. Now, let's see what UKIP propose in order to preserve and enhance our environment for the future in the absence of that European framework. Yes, you're talking about the European Union. I was asking you about your oversight of Natural Resources Wales, but thanks for leading us down a blind alley, First Minister. Well, you did now, that. Now, you, men you mentioned the oversight of NRW by the Public Accounts Committee, and I'm glad you see a valuable role for the Public Accounts Committee in doing that. Now, you, your own backbenchers, of course, have an important role to play, a crucial role to play in scrutinising organisations like Natural Resources Wales. However, we have one backbench member who has played an exceedingly valuable role on the Public Accounts Committee in, in giving oversight to Natural Resources Wales. I note that that member is being rewarded for his sterling work by being removed from the Public Accounts Committee. Doesn't this just prove, First Minister, that you do not want proper scrutiny of organisations run by your government? No. Well, uh, I find it difficult to accept what the leader of UKIP says when he says he talks of the important work of the Public Affairs Committee, which I think is correct, and he talks of the need for scrutiny, yet at the same time wants to abolish the Assembly thereby providing us with no scrutiny at all uh, over NRW or, or over anything else. He calls for a re second referendum on devolution and opposes one uh, when it comes to, uh, to Brexit. So when it comes to scrutiny, uh, his answer to greater scrutiny is to remove the very scrutineers themselves, making it far more difficult for proper scrutiny to occur. And it's because of that scrutiny that the problems in NRW have helped to be identified. In years gone by, that level of scrutiny would never have been there in the days before devolution. That scrutiny, rightly so, has been exercised by the Public uh, Accounts uh, Committee, uh, and it is a matter now for NRW, working with ourselves as a government, to rectify the situation. Now, to go back to what your member said, your member of the Public Accounts Committee, at the height of the timber fiasco, I quote, what is going on in NRW to have their accounts qualified for the third year running? It's unprecedented and frankly outrageous. I'm struggling to think of an explanation as to why this might be. Might it be corruption or incompetence? But it does appear that the forestry section of NRW is out of control. I think there needs to be accountability from the senior leadership of this organization, which does appear to be out of control." End quote. Now, you're talking about me wanting to remove scrutiny. I'm talking about wanting to remove this entire useless institution, the Welsh Assembly, of which you've been, you've been at the heart of for 18 years. The problem is not the scrutiny by backbenchers, because when they do scrutinise, you rubbish it anyway and you remove them from the committees. The point is that the government... The government the government you've been part of for 18 years isn't fit to run these institutions, and that's why the Welsh public gets an awful deal from the Welsh Assembly. Is that not the case, First Minister? Yeah, there we go. So let, let me see now. Let me see. There, there, there have been two referendums, one in 97 and 2011, he doesn't accept the result. Yet he demands, demands that there should be no referendum at all on the deal with Brexit. I mean, his, his hypocrisy is almost breathtaking. 
On the one hand, he says we need more scrutiny, and then he says we need to remove all scrutiny, without realising the, the contradiction of what he is saying. The member for Tlenefi, uh, I'm sure, is delighted by the support that's, uh, that's, been, given, <laughs> that's, been, that's been given to him by, uh, by the leader of UK. But he is, he is somebody who holds government to account from the government backbenches, and exactly how he should, how he should be, as, as should be done. You know, the, the leader is somebody, the member for is somebody who expresses his view and his right to do so. That's what government backbenches are there to do to make sure that, that as a Welsh Labour government, we get things right. Now, I'm not sure what he's saying. Get rid of the Assembly or get rid of NRW, I don't know. What I do know is that if ever UKIP got to power, and there were seven of them to begin with, there are four of them now, who knows, there may be far fewer of them in the future. Uh, and you know, part of the reason for this is because UKIP can't win anything, let's try and attack the body that we can't actually win an election to. But if ever UKIP ever got the power, we know there'd be no environmental regulatory body. It would be a free-for-all when it came to the uh, environment. Our environment would be destroyed. Our beaches would be ruined, all in the name of the mad free market philosophy that his party wants to expound. Uh, and that is the reality of uh, UKIP. We will fight to make sure that the people of Wales, yes, have the government they deserve, the scrutiny they deserve, and to keep the body that they voted for, not just once, but voted to, to, for twice in terms of extra powers. Yeah. We'll return to uh, questions on the order paper. Question three, Susie Davis. Uh, uh, will the First Minister provide an update on the Swansea Bay City deal? Well, the four local authorities have reached a milestone with the approval of their joint committee agreement. Well, that's an important step in reducing government funding. Well, uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, considering we're some way into the, the lifespans of these, uh, uh, these deals, um, it's a shame it's taken quite that long. But nevertheless, uh, the Institute for Welsh Affairs has argued that there has to be more investment, research and innovation for us to have any chance of meeting the 100% of our energy demand uh, from renewables by 2035. And the Homes as Power Station project is one aspect of uh, the Swansea Bay City deal. Last week, the UK Government announced uh, an additional £36 million for Swansea University, which is, of course, a partner uh, in the deal, taking the investment to £100 million uh, in eight years so that the university can lead on innovation in energy for the UK. It's been welcomed by Tata Steel, uh, Swansea itself, and Coastal Housing. I'm, I'm sure you welcome it as well. But it shows that the city deal is levering interest from other parties in investment. Uh, can you tell us how your overseas visits have helped to do the same from other parts of the world? Well, uh, let me give you some examples. If we look at the uh, States, I spent a lot of time talking to the uh, companies that invest uh, in Wales from America, same with Japan. Uh, I spent a lot of time with companies in uh, Europe who invest in Wales, amongst them uh, Airbus, for example, Ford, Toyota I've met. And all these organisations very much value the presence of a, of, of a First Minister or a Government Minister, because a, a Minister can open doors that officials can't and agencies can't. What are the results? Best foreign direct investment figures for 30 years. Uh, and those figures speak for themselves. Unemployment, 3.8%. That would have been un unthought of uh, in the days before devolution. She talks rightly, and she's right to say I'd support uh, the initiative she's described, but a very good way of moving forward with increasing the amount of energy generated from renewable sources would have been the Swansea Bay Tidal Lagoon, uh, which the Conservative government rejected, thereby removing our chances of innovation, of taking forward, of leading the world in a technology, the creation of a thousand jobs, and of course many, many homes and manufacturing plants powered by renewable energy. That is uh, a matter of great regret to me, uh, and uh, it's hugely important that the UK Government continues to review the decision that it has taken and to give Wales the same fair play as it wants to give to the DUP. Lee Waters. Diolch, Deputy Sheriff. Uh, I'm delighted that among the first projects that come through under the, uh, the bid is the £200 million wellness village in Llanelli, which, through its innovation, uh, promises to be an exemplar for the whole of Wales. I've been discussing with the Council how we can make sure that it joins in with the rest of Llanachie and doesn't become some out-of-town uh, development. The traffic in the area is, is already uh, intense in, in peak hours. So will the make, First Minister make sure that the emerging plans on the South Wales Metro are dovetailed into the developments around uh, the Wellness Village? Mm. Yeah, that would be crucial. I mean, we, we can't... As with any development of this size, it cannot all be car-based, it's quite right. Uh, we have the Accu Travel Act. It's hugely important that, um, as we move the metro forward, that there are proper bus connections, train connections where appropriate, uh, and, of course, opportunities for active travel. Uh, 
no development such as the wellness village, given the fact that it is a wellness village, could properly be taken wholly seriously if active travel wasn't part of the, uh, the message uh, and the ethos of that wellbeing village. So he's absolutely right to say that the last thing I'd want to see is a development creating unacceptable levels of traffic, mainly because there's no other alternative for people other than to drive. We must create those alternatives. Dyloid. Of course, in a Castella Vargan Genesigi, he and Mar Pedro are out there, Dot Seol and Neosho in Cabri and Canabo, but Trevnid Yeth, Hevet and Rubeth, and Mayang and Nancy Datris are level Ran Barthol. Agmina, Stidiath, Dihonol Ruid, Ivetro, Bay, Abertawe, Achamoy, the Gorsewin, and Amlug, Mahin and Amlug and Gampusig and Line with that plugy system, Trevnid Yeth, Cohoides, Vorden, and Neosho in Cabri, Ika Plessy, a mouth of that plugy. Mali and so on and so on. For the next time, does Brian Dim and Leon with the Cahoy there sit quite mad at her? Are the studios to handle it? Peter the King Hagwell to be the Cahoy and Cal Cooper. I'm going to that a project, ma. I can Cal Cooper drive out in New Zealand. No, he can't. Well, my mother will be the first to see the real life of the land. And when we talk about the new one, go three D are a concern. Yeah, my wife and I knew are in a breed. I don't know why. No, my and my wife knew that because he he sick and high, but then can help him. Can then see the see the effect of lacking go high this. Question for David Meldy. Make a statement on Welsh government funding for social housing. Well, social housing has always been and will always, will, always will be, of course, a fundamental priority for this government. We've never moved away from supporting those in greatest need, which is why we're making a record investment in social housing in the term of this government. I mean, First Minister, you no doubt would have heard Prime Minister's announcement for £2 billion uh, for social homes in England, and she emphasised her pride in social housing, and I think we should all uh, share that pride. It's been at the heart of the great uh, house-building programmes uh, throughout the last century uh, and sadly has tailed off uh, in, in the 21st century. As part of the UK government's uh, commitment to transform house building, um, it will give uh, uh, assured funding to housing associations, giving them long-term certainty uh, to invest. And this is something that they've called for repeatedly uh, here in Wales. So under the English scheme, associations will be able to apply for funding stretching as far ahead as 2028. 20, 29. Now, when we get the Barnet consequential, these monies do come on stream in the 2020s, <coughs> will you make a similar commitment to ring fence this money for social housing and sort out the grant schemes to housing associations so that they can invest for the long term and at last lead us to an age where we build enough houses for the people who need to live in them? Yeah. Well, there, there are... Well, I mean, can... Yeah, I have the greatest respect for the member, but coming from a party that sold off so much social housing and didn't replace it uh, and caused many of the problems we face now in the first place. So I, I do have to take that with a lot of other large pinch of salt. Uh, two things I'd say to him. Firstly, it is not clear whether there'll be a Barnet consequential yet. Uh, we know that the UK government are uh, masters and mistresses of sleight of hand and will make funding announcements and then say this money is being found from within a department, in which case we get no bad and consequential at all. We don't know is the answer to that yet. And secondly, of course, this is for 2022. Uh, I can't make commitments for uh, any governments in place post uh, 2021, not least because of the fact they won't be here. So uh, that will be a matter for any incoming government. Beth and Syed. So much of the future of the future the future of 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 the the um, and rhan o'r adolygiad um, dych chi yn cael fel llodydd, a fyddech chi'n edrych mewn i hwn um, oherwydd y falle fod na mwy o arian ar gael ar gyfer uh, tai ffordiadau, pe bydde rhai o'r arian hynny yn mynd mewn i greu mwy o tai cymdeithasol yn ein cymunedau? Well, uh, uh, my other like I mean, I'm not a lot of our best there. I'm not a lot of policy in the end. On my own hand, yes, from tai cymdeithasol a tai for the adio. Because as 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 my tai for the adio, of course, the right bobble in Rentino, the right bobble in Prino. So my only second high board, but now they wish he bobble. Same man, I guess he needed they wish honey. When I'm middle, they're both come scared or or die or gal. Right, tai cymdeithasol, of course. 
felly y rhai tai lle mae uh, equity yn cael ei rhannu, uh, tai eraill lle mae'n ymddiriadoliaeth tir cymunedol yn, yn redeg uh, 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 y stad i hunan, felly cadw'r uh, prysiau i lawr. So, felly, uh, yn nod yw sicrhau bod na bod yna ddewis eang ar gael uh, yng nghlin â pa fath o dai sydd ar gael. Na, ni wedi uh, ymrwymo yn barod i sicrhau uh, bysodiad mawr yn rhai cymdeithasol, a hefyd, wrth gwrs, ni mewn gwelem ha ffordd allwn ni hefyd i hadur yna sydd yn edrych i brynu, ond wrth gwrs, y ffili y ffordd o hwnna'r hyn o bryd. Jane Hutt. First Minister, given that the uh, size of social housing stock declined dramatically since 1980, when the right to buy was introduced, resulting in longer waiting times for people in housing need, um, will you join me in welcoming the end to right to buy by a Welsh Labour government via the abolition of the right to buy and associated rights Wales Act 2018? Will you also welcome Welsh Government investment in social housing in my constituency, the Vale of Glamorgan, including uh, not only extensive investment through uh, uh, our social housing grant to housing associations, the building of new council housing by, in fact, what was then a uh, Labour uh, council of running the Vale of Glamorgan, and also, importantly, 2.8 billion major repairs allowance to enable the Vale of Glamorgan Council to bring social housing up to the Welsh housing quality standard. Well, I was fortunate enough uh, to uh, join uh, the member for St Gibbons then, when we saw the uh, refurbishment work that was taking place uh, there. Uh, and local people, of course, were, were delighted with what they, uh, what they saw there. I've always said that if you, don't, if you try and build social housing while at the same time still have the right to buy, it's like filling up the bath or the plug out. Except for the whole of the 1980s, the Tories uh, let the plug out and didn't leave the taps on at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you, can't, you can't replace. Uh, your housing stock if you uh, allow it to be sold at a rate that doesn't allow you to keep up. It's one of the reasons why we saw so much homelessness, particularly uh, that began in the 1980s, because public housing wasn't available. In Powers, I think, I remember reading, around a half of the public housing stock was lost and never replaced. Now, how on earth can that be fair on people in rural areas, particularly when it's difficult to buy in some rural areas, because people move in with lots of money from elsewhere and local people can't compete. Uh, so it's hugely important that we, uh, we ensure that there's a proper supply of public housing, and that does mean, of course, uh, creating a situation where public housing remains just that, public. Question five, Sean Gwendolyn. Anochi gyhoeddi am serlen benodol ar gyfer dysglygu Park Business, Park Bryn Kegin, ger Bangor. Well, mae tîr y dyblygu ym Hark Bryn Cegyn ar gael i'w dyblygu nawr, ac yn cael ei farchnata drwy'n hasiant eiddo masnachol, sef cwc yn Arkwright, ein cron fa ddata eiddo a chyngor gwynedd. Fe cyhoeddwyd y cynlluniau cyntaf ar gyfer y parc busnas yma yn y flwyddyn 2,000. Fe adeiladwyd ffyrdd newydd a chylchfan newydd ac agorwyd mynedfa i'r parc. Fe addawyd o leia 1,500 o swyddi. Dyna mlynedd yn ddiweddarach, dos na ddim un swydd, yr un swydd o gwbl wedi cael ei chreu um, er gweithar holl filiynau gallu fydd soddi i ddatblygu Park Bryn Cegyn. Ond nid ydy'n bryd i Lywodraeth Cymru rhoi blenoriaeth egni a brwdfrydedd i'r dasg o ddatblygu Park Bryn Cegyn. Well, Hanes Park Bryn Cegyn yw hwnna, mae'r mae oedd yn wir i weud ta bod yr hanes yn ôl dyna mlynedd. Uh, mi oedd na uh, ganiatad cynllunio, uh, wedi cael ei roi ynglyn â chyflogaeth, sef y tri oedd a swyddfeydd ar y pryd hynny, fe nithon ni i fysodi yn, yn drwm rhwng 2008 er mwyn paratoi'r safle uh, i, i ddatblygiad, sef dod i'r hewlydd mewn uh, a dod i'r gwasanaethau mewn. Ond, of course, yn 2008, fi wedi'n yn y crash. Ac ar ôl hynny, dechrau iddo fod yn anodd uh, ar yr amser hynny uh, i, i dynnu uh, bob ond mewn o achos y ffaith bod hwnna wedi, wedi digwydd. Uh, Mae yna, uh, o beth nawr, yn un a sicrhau bod uh, y sefyllfa yn symud, uh, symud mlaen. Mi'n deall bod uh, y datblygydd, sef Liberty Properties, wedi gweud bod na sinema mawr uh, felly yn dod uh, i, i'r safle i hunan. Uh, ac wrth gwrs yn edrych mlaen ystod hwnna'n wir, yn edrych mlaen felly hwnna fe, felly i, um, I helpu'r uh, safle i ddatblygu wrth dynnu mwy uh, o fusnesau mewn yn y pen draw. Question 6, Heaven David. What action is the Welsh Government taking to address the problem of estate management charges? Well, the review of unadopted roads initiated by the Cabinet Secretary for Economy and Transport is now underway, and that work will complement that of the Leaf Soul Advisory Group 
convened by the Minister for Housing and uh, Regeneration. And, uh, I know the member has raised this before in this chamber. It's a hugely important uh, issue, uh, something that is relatively new in its concept, but one which uh, we must uh, deal with in order to make sure people aren't exploited. And, and increasingly so, people are bri buying uh, freehold accommodation and being forced to pay these charges to private companies on top of their council tax to maintain their estates. Um, in Cumcallon, in Estra in my constituency, is Meadfleet, the estate management company there, have announced that the charges are going to rise per uh, six months from £61 to £78. And there's nothing, nothing anyone can do about it. It's totally beyond democratic control. Um, ten years ago, Barnet Council became known as the EasyJet Council, whereby people pay extra for their uh, uh, services on top of their council tax for so-called additional services. It's now known as the Outsourced Council. Well, estate management charges are outsourcing by stealth, but at least with EasyJet, you can choose whether you pay for overpriced peanuts. What more can the government do? I can uh, assure the member that this, this is part of what the task and finish group will be considering. You know, he makes the point quite rightly that where new estates of houses are built, people are uh, these days often told there is a service charge to pay for grass cutting, a service charge to pay for uh, upkeep, pay for the roads, pay for the payments, but they're still say, paying council tax at the same level, of course. You know, so they're paying twice uh, for a service that should be provided by a local authority. I would hope that no local authority in Wales sees estate management charges as a way of granting planning permission without the ongoing revenue cost that an estate of houses uh, would cost them. I hope that isn't the case, but certainly I can give him that assurance that this will be something that the Task and Finish Group will look at. Question 7, Dawn Bowden. Uh, what action is the Welsh Government taking to help prevent identity fraud? Well, this is primarily a matter of the UK Government, but we're committed to making our communities safer and to continue to work with the UK Government to tackle crime. Uh, thank you, First Minister. And as you all know, identity fraud is a, is a serious criminal activity which can cost individuals heavily. An analysis by the anti-fraud uh, organisation CIFAS shows that in Wales there has been some reduction in the overall number of frauds, but identity fraud rose by about 14 per cent between 2016 and 2018, and there were over 4,000 cases in, in Wales in 2017. So would you join me in recognising the important work carried out by organisations, including Trading Standards, and Age Cymru, which help more vulnerable citizens in tackling this crime. And can you tell me what more the Welsh Government could do to raise awareness of the advice being offered to protect ourselves against identity fraud? Well, I can tell the member that uh, an individual uh, that I'm aware of has taken out a loan with a bank, has defaulted on that loan, and informed the bank that they have moved to where we live. So I'm receiving letters myself. Uh, now, addressed not to me, but to this individual at my address, so no one is... Uh, uh, it can, can escape us, but it's an important point. And I know that you had an event in the Senate on the 19th of September raising awareness of uh, tackling fraud and scams. Uh, of course, uh, the Cabinet Secretary approved up to £3,000 of funding for the Wales Against Scams uh, Partnership, uh, which is hugely uh, helpful. Uh, I know that he has also met with uh, the Minister of the Home Office to discuss the serious organised crime strategy implementation to meet the needs of uh, Wales. Uh, and, of course, we will continue to provide funding of £16.8 million in the next financial year for an additional 500 community support offices in Wales. Thank you. Question 8, Neil Hamilton. <coughs> will the First Minister provide an update on the Welsh Government's preferred outcome from the ongoing Brexit negotiations? It is to be found in the White <coughs> Paper securing Wales's future. I thank the First Minister for that uninformative reply. Uh, but, um, <coughs> I'm sure the First Minister will agree with me that Theresa May has badly bungled the negotiations with uh, Brussels. Um, the Chequers proposals were always going to be stillborn. Uh, no real preparations have been made for leaving the EU without a deal. Um, and there isn't much time left to negotiate a free trade uh, agreement, such as the one which was agreed with Canada. <coughs> um, where does the Labour Party stand in all this? Sir Keir Starmer, the Brexit spokesman for... Labour in the UK seems to have said that uh, Labour will vote against anything that Theresa May comes up with or is allowed to come up with between now and next March. Jeremy Corbyn, with whom I marched through many lobbies voting against EU legislation over the years, seems to be sitting on the fence. 
Uh, Keir Starmer seems to have made it clear that he wants a second re referendum come what may, whereas John Macdonald, on the other hand, says that whilst he's in favour of a people's vote on whatever emerges, it shouldn't include the option of leaving the EU. What does the First Minister think? Should there be a second referendum in which there is an option for leaving the EU or not? <laughs> Well, I mean, the first thing to say is there is an increasing mood music in this chamber and outside that if there is no deal and therefore a disaster, it will be the fault of the Remainers and not the fault of those who gave a pie-in-the-sky analysis two years ago of what the referendum would mean. We were told there would be the easiest negotiation ever. It hasn't been. We were told the EU would, would fold in the face of the UK's demands. It hasn't done. We were told the German car manufacturers would ride to the rescue, would drive to the rescue and would force the German government to accept the deal favour of the UK. They haven't done it. The reality is the UK is more divided than the EU has been at all in the course of this process. Now, he asked my view on it. First of all, uh, to put this in context, uh, I've heard his party argue strongly against a second referendum, and yet he was a member of a party who, for eight years, argued strongly for a second referendum after 1997 because they didn't like the result and went into the 2005 general election on a manifesto of having a second referendum on the existence of the assembly. So there's a certain level of double standards there uh, that has to be recognised. Now, what do I think uh, should happen? Firstly, uh, if there is, uh, if there is not, no agreement on a deal, in other words, that means no deal uh, or no agreement on a proposed deal in not just Westminster but this place, and Edinburgh as well, I don't see any alternative other than a general election. And in that general election, Brexit would be the, the only topic, I suspect, of discussion. Uh, in that general election, uh, it is right to say that the issue could be given a, a proper airing and the people could decide. If, however, uh, the result of that general election was inconclusive, well, how else do you then resolve the issue other than by going back to the very people who made the decision in the first place, but who now would be in a position to see exactly what Brexit would mean. Now, to me, uh, that is the point where a second referendum becomes something that, is, uh, that, that would need to be looked at, because how else do you resolve the, uh, the situation? At this moment in time, I think we have to wait and see what happens in October and uh, November, uh, and then take decisions from there. Stephen Lewis. Uh, but in terms of uh, a, um, a general election in the event of an impasse of the House of Commons, what, what does the First Minister think uh, would be achieved by any outcome that is possible there? Because, of course, both Theresa May and Jeremy Corbyn mm. want to take us out mm. of the single market and the customs union. Mm. So surely a choice of hard Brexit isn't, isn't a choice at all. Um, and I noticed that in his reply to Mr Hamilton, he failed to answer one very important and timely question, which is the fact that if there is to be a referendum on the deal or no deal scenarios, should there also be a question they're asking the people whether or not they wish to remain in the European Union? I, I think that is, uh, that's likely. Uh, I think that there are two possibilities here, are there not? If there's no deal, uh, then it would be no deal or remain. If there is a deal, it becomes a bit more complicated in the sense it's, you know, do you accept the deal? But if you don't, what do you want? No deal or remain? You know, the ways in which the Electoral Commission, I'm sure, can finesse that uh, uh, that referendum. But if there's no deal on the table, well, surely people have the right to express a view as to whether they wish to leave in circumstances that not one Brexiteer suggested would happen. No, nobody said two years ago, if there's no deal, it doesn't matter. No one said it. Everyone said there will be a deal. That's changed. I don't like the idea of, of a second referendum on exactly the same issue, which is why I opposed the second referendum in 1997. But where the circumstances have changed fundamentally, where the promises that were made two years ago have come to nothing, then at that point, and if there's an inconclusive result in the general election, and who knows what parties might put forward in the general election, I'm sure the Lib Dems will put forward something quite different again. I'm sure his party will as well. But there has to come a point where if there is an impasse, the people have to decide. Uh, and they have to be allowed to decide on the basis of what they know now and not on what they were told two years ago, which hasn't happened. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, First Minister. Item two on the agenda this afternoon is the business statement and announcements, and I call on the Leader of the House, Julie James. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. There are two changes to this week's business. Today's statement on Brexit and support for further education and skills has been withdrawn, and tomorrow the time allocated to the Council General's Oral Assembly questions has been reduced. Draft business for the next three weeks is set out in the business statement and announcement, which can be found amongst the meeting papers available to members electronically.
Darren Miller. Deputy Presiding Officer, can I call for three statements from the uh, Leader of the House today on behalf of the Government? First is in relation to the Trunk Road network and its maintenance. The, uh, the Leader of the House will be aware that there have been significant delays on the A55 uh, in North Wales recently in my own constituency as a result of roadworks which have uh, caused a closure uh, in Llanvillas. And uh, the tailbacks have been as long as uh, eight miles, uh, with delays of, uh, in excess of half an hour for traffic going in either direction. Now, we were assured at that time, my constituents were assured, that work would be ongoing 24-7 in order to keep those delays and the disruption to a minimum. But unfortunately, it would appear that the works are shutting down completely uh, in some evenings, uh, which is completely uh, not in accordance with the assurances which were provided to my uh, constituents. So I wonder uh, whether you could have uh, the Cabinet Secretary with the responsibility for the Trunk Road Network to provide an update to my constituents in order that they can be reassure, reassured that this disruption will be uh, at an absolute minimum in the future and that work throughout the nights uh, will be uh, taking place for the duration uh, of the rest uh, of the works. Secondly, can I call for a statement from the uh, Minister for the Environment? Um, it's been a a regular call of mine to address the problems in terms of the old Colwyn coastal defences and I was very grateful for the fact that the Minister visited my constituency to inspect the defences uh, for herself. But in spite of the very positive meeting which took place, I've recently received a letter uh, from the Minister which seems to suggest that this is not a priority uh, for the Welsh Government and that there will not be the usual level of grant funding which would be made available in order that the scheme uh, can uh, take place uh, because uh, residential homes um, are less likely to benefit than the Government seems to uh, imagine. Now, of course, this is a part of the coastal defence network which protects the vital transport infrastructure that is the North Wales railway line, the A55 uh, trunk road, and protects the sewerage system for the whole of the Bay of Colwyn. So quite how it can be suggested that this isn't benefiting homes uh, and businesses uh, is beyond me. Now, it's going to take the Welsh Government to actually get to grips with this problem and bring the various parties together that need to make a contribution uh, to the works. And I have to say I'm astounded to have received this letter, and so is the local authority, following that meeting, which I thought was very productive. Uh, so I would be grateful if there could be a statement on coastal defences from the Minister and she could explain uh, the situation. And finally, can I call for a statement? statement uh, on uh, red squirrels. People will know that I'm the red squirrel yeah, yeah. champion here in the National yeah, Assembly yeah, yeah. and I had the opportunity to visit some of the excellent conservation work which is taking place in the Clochainog Forest in my own constituency and on Ernest Morn which is being undertaken by the Red Squirrels Trust in Wales in partnership with Red Squirrels uh, United. Uh, this week is Red Squirrels Awareness Week and uh, the Welsh Mountain Zoo in my constituency is part of uh, an international breeding programme for this very important protected species. I would be grateful to know what action the Welsh Government is going to take so that the good work which is being done by these projects will be able to continue once the current grant funding comes to an end next year. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you. I um, commend the, the member for getting uh, quite a lot of his own uh, constituency stuff in there, so very well done. Uh, in terms of the first trunk road uh, issue that he raised, um, the Cabinet Secretary is indicating to me that that's not his understanding, and indeed it's not my understanding either, and therefore he uh, proposes to write to you to uh, get an understanding of where you are and why you think that, and so that we can put that right, as my understanding is that the work is continuing 24-7 and ought to be so. So we can, we can put that right in correspondence if you can um, provide the detail. That would be great. In terms of the uh, coastal defence issue, it sounds as if you're already in correspondence with the uh, Cabinet Secretary, albeit you've uh, indicated your... Um, lack of, uh, what should we say, uh, cohesion uh, with her. So I would, con I, I would suggest that that's a matter that you should raise either in questions or in continued correspondence. And in terms of your uh, championship of the red squirrels, um, delighted to uh, find the species champion scheme working so well here in the Assembly. I'm going to take the unashamed chance to say that I'm the species champion for the native oyster, which is now being reseeded in Swansea Bay. And I, too, am very fond of the scheme. I'm sure that the Cabinet Secretary will update us in due course about the continued funding for such a scheme. Dyloid. Uh, our Leader of the House, uh, you will no doubt be aware that the company behind the £1.3 billion Tidal Lagoon project in Swansea has now agreed a company voluntary agreement with its creditors to give it up to two years to find 
a way to deliver this project. And as you will know also, hopes are still alive in Swansea that this project can get off the ground. And in an event in the city last week, Tidal Lagoon Power's Mark Shorrock stated that he wanted to su supply electricity directly to organisations and homes in Swansea via private cables, something which he hopes will make the project commercially viable without any support from the UK Government. We also know that the Swansea Bay City Region has established a task force into the lagoon and that discussions have taken place with Welsh public sector pension funds with regards to possible investment. However, one thing that was noted during last week's meeting was that since the decision by the UK Government in June not to back the Tidal Lagoon scheme, the Welsh Government has not discussed with the company the £200 million that it had previously stated it would be prepared to invest earlier this year. Therefore, with different financing and ownership models on the table, there is a clear question in terms of what role the Welsh Government is going to play in helping to deliver this project. This project has the ability to provide a much-needed economic boost to Swansea and South West Wales, and it's vitally important that, with the UK Government having again neglected Wales, that the Welsh Government steps up to the mark. With all of that in mind, could I ask that the Government bring forward a statement on the Swansea Bay Tidal Lagoon, which will outline clearly what the Government position is, what work it has undertaken over recent months on the issue, how it is working with the local authorities in the region, its view on possible Welsh Government investment, and its preferred model for delivering the scheme. Jochavar. Um, yes, it's a very important matter for, for everyone in Wales, never mind those of us who represent uh, Swansea constituencies and regions. Um, I can confirm that the 200 um, is still on the table. Um, we are working alongside the task force. As soon as we know where the task force is going, then we will be able to come forward with a statement. But it is, um, we are working very closely with the task force and uh, certainly will not be spent on anything else in the meantime. But there are a number of options, as the member knows, and as all members uh, know, on the table for taking forward Tidal Lagoon power. And until we know what those options are, we're not in a position to specifically say. But nevertheless, the Welsh Government continues its vehement support and vehement condemnation, I have to say, of the UK Government's lack of uh, investment in this project. David Rees. Leader of the House, we have two statements, one from the Cabinet Secretary for Health, who has left the Chamber at the moment, on sometime before the whole October recess, on the boundary changes progress as far as Cumtaf, ABMU board is concerned. So we can help update on what's happening and where we will be going, because this will take effect as of April next year. And it's important that we, as members, are able to have that detailed an opportunity to examine the Cabinet Secretary on those matters. And the second point is, as you may well know, uh, we had a long campaign in Aberavon on the Junction 41 closure trial that existed, and we eventually managed to persuade the Cabinet Secretary for Economy and Transport that the decision to stop the trials and keep the uh, junction open was the right decision, and that has been working ever since. Now, last week, the re report commissioned by the Welsh Government on the M4, Junction 41 to 42, temporary 40, 50 million hour speed limit and the emissions has been published. And in that is the reintroduction of a possibility of closing the westbound slip road for Junction 41 again. This clearly is unacceptable in my constituency, and I will once again be fighting any chances of this happening. But can you have a statement from the Cabinet Secretary of Economy and Transport to reaffirm his decision, uh, the earlier start of this government, to keep that junction open and operational? Because any attempt to close that junction on the grounds of pollution I can assure you, will increase pollution on the ground where people are breathing in as the cars get congested in the local roads. It is not an answer to this, and whoever wrote this clearly doesn't know the streets or the congestion caused during that trial. Dries has always been uh, very uh, active on behalf of his constituents in, uh, in this, in this uh, instance. The measure currently proposed at Port Talbot to achieve compliance with the EU Air Quality Directive is a continuation, as he knows, of the temporary 50 mile an hour speed limit Im implemented back in June. However, uh, at this point, the total closure of Junction 41 can't be ruled out for legal reasons because the monitoring of NO2 concentration is ongoing and depending on results, it's possible that further measures, measures may be required to safeguard public health and comply with the legislation. However, if that were to happen, further measures proposed would be subject to a full public consultation before any action is taken to take that forward. Um, in terms of the um, realignment of ABMU and Comtav, um, I'm sure that the Cabinet Secretary will be updating members as soon as uh, that, that has sufficiently progressed uh, for there be, to be something substantial to report. 
Mohammed Dashka. Yeah. Presiding officer, may I ask for a statement from the Cabinet Secretary for Health on mandatory eye tests for motorists in Wales, please? In May last year, a driver I'm, with I'm poor sorry, I eyesight. Hear that, um, Mohammed Ashka, could you repeat it? Sorry. Okay. Leader of the House, may I ask for a statement from the Cabinet Secretary for Health on mandatory eye test for motorists in Wales, please? In May last year, a driver with a poor eyesight who defied his optician's advice to stay off the road was jailed for seven years after he killed a motorist in an accident on M4 in Newport. At the moment, it is the responsibility of the driver to advise the DVLA that they are no longer able to drive. Can I ask for a statement on what plan the Cabinet Secretary has to strengthen the guidance issued to opticians to make it mandatory that they advise the DVLA when a driver's eyesight has deteriorated to such an extent that they are a danger to themselves and to other motorists on the road. Please. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Deputy Presiding Officer, I'm, I'm not actually sure quite where the devolution settlement is on that, so what I'll do is I'll undertake to discuss that with the Cabinet Secretary for Health and come back to the member. Thank you. Clear Griffith. Diolch-Rhyfel-Wyd-Mavorion-Ddwrnod-Llaith-Ysgol-Ybyd-A-Dwi'n-Gobeithio-Bydd-Ilod-Y-Cynulliad-Ymwynhau-Ybyn-J
And secondly, with regard to the Welsh Transport Appraisal Guidance consultation on a proposed M4 A48 link road, concerns have been raised with me about the proposed membership of the Vale of Glamorgan Council Review Group to, due to meet on October the 2nd. My constituents feel that the current membership is not representative of the four aspects of well-being, social, cultural, environmental and economic interests, and I would welcome a response from the Cabinet Secretary for Economy and Transport on that point. Um, yes, thank you for those two important issues, uh, Jane Hutt. With regard to the Welsh Transport Appraisal Guidance, or WELTAG, on the M4A48 Link Road, um, concerns have been raised about the membership of the Vale of Glamorgan Council Review Group, and uh, 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 the Cabinet Secretary um, is, is um, going to discuss the issue with the Vale of Glamorgan so that we can get a full understanding of quite where we are with that, and I'm sure he will feed back the outcome of that. Uh, to you in due course. Thank you for having raised it with him. Um, in terms of the domestic abuse and universal credit issue that you raise, a very fundamentally important issue. We know, Deputy uh, Presiding Officer, that uh, one of the main causes of domestic violence and domestic abuse is economic uh, inequality in the home, and that um, we know that that's a continuing problem. And with the uh, changes in the benefit system, which particularly affect the purse and not the wallet to use that, uh, that way of cutting it, we know that that circumstance will only get worse. We also know that the amount of money taken out of the Welsh economy is bound to have an effect on the most vulnerable in our society. I am due to make a number of statements and also to have a debate on a number of issues around the violence against women, domestic violence and sexual violence agenda over the uh, autumn. And I look forward to having a robust discussion about some of the real issues affecting people fleeing domestic violence, as well as those currently experiencing um, who have not yet uh, found the wherewithal to flee, but in particular as well, to continue our campaign to ensure that we have gender equality as part of the gender review, and that has to include a better financial settlement for women in the system as a whole, because we know that that sort of inequality leads to further uh, violence uh, in the home. So I look forward to a number of, I'm going to bring a specific statement on that particular issue, but there will be plenty of opportunity. I hope we will be able to have a robust discussion about exactly where we are. I think there are two, if not three, opportunities to do that over the coming term. Thank you. Mark is yours. Yeah. Can I call for, please, two uh, Welsh Government statements? The first on access to pulmonary rehabilitation for interstitial lung disease, or ILD, uh, patients. Last week was uh, I I IPF, or I Idiopathic Pulmonary Fibrosis Week, and according to the British Lung Foundation, pulmonary fibrosis is a, is a type of interstitial lung disease. Pulmonary re rehabilitation is often focused on other conditions such as COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, due to its prevalence with over 70,000 people in Wales, or 2.3% of the population affected. But there's a growing body of evidence that tailored uh, pulmonary rehabilitation provision uh, for ILD can contribute significantly to improve quality of life in accordance with NICE uh, guidelines. Last week, the Health Secretary wrote to me that the Respiratory Health Delivery Plan for Wales, uh, which was updated and published in January, includes a, quote, national work stream for interstitial lung disease and the establishment of regional specialist teams to support local care. But therefore, I call for a statement detailing uh, what progress, if any, there's been in actually developing a pulmonary rehabilitation pathway for ILD patients and when the Welsh Government expects that to be in place. My second request for a statement um, is, is on um, the, the Wales for Africa Health Links Network. Mm -hmm. During the summer, I had a, a very useful meeting with trustees of uh, the registered charity Wales for Africa Health Links Network uh, to discuss the various health links across North Wales. Uh, they told me about the links between Wrexham Myler and Glancluid Hospital and Ethiopia, and between Asbuti Gwynedd uh, and Lesotho. Uh, they told me that they were getting a big impact for a small input because there were so many volunteers giving their time free, particularly health professionals, who were therefore also able to develop their soft skills and benefiting the NHS, with the, quote, Welsh Government getting great value uh, for money in terms of global health, global responsibility, international links and soft uh, diplomacy, as well as the soft skills they themselves were developing. 
They told me that key commitments from the NHS for institutional international health links, uh, represented by the Charter for International Health Partnerships, but the, that the NHS and health boards have been very slow in implementing their, implementing their commitments, and that although the Welsh Government's Wales for Africa programme has been a success in having an impact for the benefit of communities in Wales and Africa, and being very good for the reputation of Wales as a country, the Welsh Government's support for the programme has been static uh, for years. Uh, will you therefore consider providing a uh, statement uh, in this context where uh, there's evidence to show that doing a little bit more uh, could have a massive further beneficial impact to both Wales, but particularly to the communities in Africa that these professionals are giving their voluntary time to support? Um, yes, well, starting with that one, I mean, obviously, we're very proud of the Wales for Africa scheme, and the members outlined, uh, I think, very ably the fact that it benefits both Wales itself and the professionals and, uh, well, everyone who volunteers on the programme, and, of course, it benefits the African countries that take part in it. Um, I, without wanting to take anything away from that, obviously, we have very difficult budget decisions to be making. Would that we could put more money into such a scheme? I only wish that were possible, but unfortunately, in the face of the budget that Welsh Government has at the moment, that's not going to be able to be a priority. And I very much regret that, Deputy Presiding Officer, that the uh, austerity agenda that we face is driving us to some very difficult decisions, and I'm afraid that's not going to be able to be uh, one of the priorities, and that's a matter for some regret, as, as are a number of other schemes that will face uh, those kinds of funding static situations over the coming years. In terms of the pulmonary uh, issue, um, the member indicates is already in correspondence with the Cabinet Secretary, and he's pointed out himself that the re respiratory health plan recognises the importance of, of timely and expert care, um, and the that the national plan um, includes a work scheme to improve ILD care across Wales, and that the NHS of Wales has established the two specialist services to support the local management of conditions. I'm not sure at this point the government has much to add to that in a statement. The member obviously will have the opportunities to question the Cabinet Secretary further on that in due course. Thank you. Stefan Lewis. Um, I'd like to ask Welsh Government for a statement um, on the consultation currently underway in Caerphilly on the potential closure of up to seven leisure facilities uh, in the county borough. I think a statement is appropriate for, for two primary reasons. Firstly, I know that a number of members of the public have tried to engage with the consultation process and they found it very rigid. They, liked, they would have liked an opportunity to have elaborated further on their views and some of the multi-option uh, questions being asked are uh, not particularly broad in their range. And so that really raises questions about the confidence local people can have in the consultation that their views are being taken seriously. But secondly, of course, as we approach a, a health ticking time bomb in terms of lack of physical activity and obesity, is it really appropriate that at this point we make it harder for citizens in Caerphilly to be physically active, especially given the provisions of the future uh, uh, well -be the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. One of the leisure centres had a record attendance rate um, in a recent financial year the, at Pontchian Frith, um, and more than 80 clubs and groups rely on its facilities. So I, I would really be grateful for a Welsh Government statement uh, on, on the plight of leisure facilities in Caerphilly. Um, yes, I mean, a matter of leisure services, as the member knows, is a matter for the local authority, but I share his concern that uh, the austerity agenda drives some decisions around uh, upstream health care, if you like, the sorts of leisure and actually community cohesion type facilities that, that those sorts of decisions make. Um, it's not a matter for us how Caerphilly conducts its, uh, its uh, consultations on these matters, but I'm sure if he writes in to the Cabinet Secretary with his concerns, we can look at it further. Julie Morgan. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, I'm sure the a Leader of the House will be aware that many families from Wales went up to London yesterday for the opening of the public inquiry into contaminated uh, blood. And as the Leader of the House will know, uh, 70 people from, over 70 people from Wales lost their lives through this scandal and many others have had their lives ruined. Um, so this is a, a moment of huge importance um, to Welsh families. And last week, I met the families and their barristers um, to listen to the evidence that they were preparing for the public inquiry. And it seems that each individual um, uh, person has to request their case notes individually from the uh, local health boards. But also, the local health boards have to produce um, information, general information, 
from the 1970s, when, and of course, there have been lots of changes um, of um, organisations um, in Wales. Um, so I wondered um, whether it would be possible to have um, information from the government about um, any role it may play during this long process, which is likely to last maybe three years, at the, at the most optimistic, um, and whether there's likely to be any help for health authorities in what is going to be a fairly uh, major task. Um, yes, I know the members have campaigned long and hard for this, and we're all absolutely delighted to see the inquiry finally start. And I hope very much that some of the very understandable um, uh, concerns of some of the people who we've seen um, giving interviews on TV and so on as to the efficacy of the inquiry can be assuaged by having a full judicial inquiry. Um, we've made sure that all health boards and trusts in Wales have confirmed they will comply with Rule 9 of the Inquiries Act and provide information when, required by the when and as required by the inquiry. Uh, we agree that the inquiry will take approximately until July, August 2020 before likely uh, reports will uh, take place. We've also ha had confirmation from all of our health boards and trusts that no charge will be made for those affected for access or copying of medical records, uh, should those be required, and the Cabinet Secretary has made inquiries as to uh, making sure that we can do that with some dispatch. If there does seem to be any kind of problem with that, I'm sure the member will raise that with us, but we have made proactive inquiries to ensure that that process can be as smooth as possible, and she's pointed out uh, rightly that, of course, some of this stuff goes back a long way. Um, but the health boards have all confirmed that they will comply with, uh, uh, stand ready and waiting to comply uh, as ably as possible and that no charge will be made for any of the access or copying that might be required as a result of that. And as I say, we hope that the inquiry can go swiftly and smoothly and get the right conclusion. And, you know, the sense of closure and justice that the campaigners have long fought for and rightly so. Andrew Burns. Uh, the Presiding Officer, uh, Leader of the House, the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Social Services published a written statement on the 25th of September concerning the Doctors and Dentists Review Body and their <coughs> pay recommendations. Um, whilst it was um, good news to see that there's going to be an increase across uh, this portion of the NHS, um, and also I was delighted to read the written statement, I do believe that we need a full um, oral statement from the Cabinet Secretary on this matter. Um, there are um, potential effects on agency and locum spend. There are question marks to also uh, understand and um, get to grips with in terms of specialist and associate uh, specialist staff. And I'd also like to understand how the Cabinet Secretary for Health flexed his figures um, so that when he says this deal goes beyond what was agreed for doctors and dentists over the border, and by which I assume he's referring to uh, England, um, you know, as we know that in England they made a statement in June and July of this year, 2% base increase for salaried doctors and dentists, salaried general medical practitioners, and independent contractor GMPs and general dental practitioners, which is exactly Exactly the same as the figures here. So I'd like to have a really clear understanding of um, what the, um, the Cabinet Secretary is saying, and I think it would be very useful for us to be able to flesh this out so that we're all um, singing off the same hymn sheet. Yes, we very much welcome the Health Secretary's announcement of a new pay deal for doctors and dentists in Wales, which indeed includes a higher salary increase than the deal agreed in England. Um, we've uh, committed additional funding to fulfil those recommendations. Uh, of course, the reality is that our budgets are limited, so there, there are other consequences. We're very happy that the BMA Cymru Wales have agreed to work in partnership with us and NHS employers to deliver the ambitions set out in Healthy Wales around the long-term sustainability of the workforce and delivery of the primary care model for Wales. And our recent agreement on the pay rise for the rest of the NHS Wales workforce shows we're committed to investing in the staff to ensure they can continue to deliver excellent health and social care. And together, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, with recruitment campaigns like Train, Work, Live, this will help us create a workforce that can deliver a long-term vision for the NHS in Wales, and we very much welcome that. Joyce Watson. Uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Leader of the House, I was delighted to see the news uh, uh, from Labour Party conference yesterday uh, that this government intends to ratify the Istanbul Convention on Com Combating Violence Against Women and Girls. Uh, the Convention is hugely important and comprehensive uh, legal framework for countries to adhere to in combating gender-based violence. 26 countries have ratified it so far, including Germany, France and Italy, 
but the UK has not. More than a million women experience domestic abuse in England and Wales each year. Uh, two women a week are killed by partners or ex-partners. Uh, we must be at the forefront of com combating uh, what is a, an evil in our society. And we will do well to remember that 101 women in Wales alone lost their lives as a consequence of violence against them by a partner or ex-partner last year. So we cannot afford to fall behind, and that is why I welcome that statement yesterday. But what I would like, uh, Cabinet Secretary, uh, is a government statement uh, outlining the process and the time scale for ratification and uh, time to discuss the implications for Welsh policy, legislation and also the support services that we will need perhaps to re-evaluate in terms of that ratification. Um, yes, I, I very much uh, welcome um, the members' complete commitment to this over a long term is well known and uh, we, uh, I very much welcome the FM's uh, commitment to us ratifying as far as we can the elements of the Istanbul Convention. Obviously it has to be ratified at uh, state level and uh, unfortunately we can't do that all by ourselves but we've been working very closely with the UK government and we, have as, uh, we will commit and have already committed as far as possible to incorporate all the elements of the Istanbul Convention that apply to us as a devolved administration into Welsh legislation. Um, as uh, the member points out, the purposes of the Vordo SV Act were to prevent violence against women, gender-based violence and domestic abuse and sexual violence, and to support and protect victims and survivors. The UK, uh, in fairness, the UK has already some of the most robust protections in the world against violence against women. Um, there are some extraterritorial jurisdiction matters that are not yet incorporated into domestic law at UK level. They require primary legislation to be introduced across the UK for us to be able to fully ratify those elements as a, as a uh, uh, as United Kingdom. They don't apply here in Wales. Um, the domestic abuse bill, which the United Kingdom uh, legislature has set out, will include the necessary provisions on extraterritorial ter jurisdiction to incorporate those currently overseen by the European Court of Justice into domestic mm. law so that we can be assured that even in leaving the, uh, the European Union, we will not be deprived of those, uh, those protections for, against sexual violence which are so necessary uh, in the world that uh, Joyce Watson has so ably set out. Thank you. Finally, Nick Ramsey. Uh, I will be brief. I know time is pressing. At Leader of the House, I recently met with representatives of Moncare, a big lottery and disability Wales supported initiative to improve social care in towns and villages across Wales through a cooperative co-production type model. It seems to me it's a type of project that ticks the Welsh Government's boxes, ticks local authorities' boxes, ticks the co-production uh, box. They, but they would like a bit more support in terms of raising the profile of what they're trying to achieve in Monmouthshire and also uh, in terms of rolling out their model wide, more widely across Wales. They want to put the citizen at the centre, put the uh, patient at the centre of their care. As I said, I was very impressed by what they had to uh, offer and what they were talking to me about. So I wonder if we could have a statement from the Welsh Government or if you could have a discussion with your colleagues about how this project could be supported. Um, yes, if the member wants to write to me with some of the details, we can certainly look into that. Uh, it sounds uh, any, anything that uh, is done via co-production and puts the citizen at the centre of uh, uh, being in control of their own personal circumstances and care is very much to be welcome. So if you want to write to me with details, I'll make sure that we can look into it. Thank you very much, Leader of House. Item three on the agenda this afternoon is a statement by the Cabinet Secretary for Education, the Evaluation and Improvement Arrangements. And I call on the Cabinet Secretary for Education, Kirsty Williams. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, it has uh, been a widely held view that for too long, Wales's education accountability system has not had the desired effect in raising standards. In fact, in some instances, it has led to unintended consequences with detrimental effects on individual pupils' education. These unintended consequences are well rehearsed from schools overly focusing on the arbitrary C grade boundary, regardless of pupil's progress and ability, to cases where schools focus so much on what they believe they are held to account for that they have narrowed the curriculum to an unacceptable level. Our National Mission Action Plan sets out our vision for an assessment and evaluation system that is fair, coherent and based on our shared values for Welsh education. 
International evidence and the message within Wales is clear. We must ensure a coherent approach that avoids those unintended consequences and contributes towards raising standards in all of our classrooms, by all of our teachers, for all of our learners. I have already taken action, such as addressing incorrect use of GCSE early entry and announcing new interim and transitional performance measures for secondary schools to ensure that every child counts regardless of their background or their ability. The overall assessment and evaluation framework will be published next year alongside the new curriculum areas of learning and experience. It will describe how learners will be assessed in schools, how teachers will be appraised and the evaluation arrangements for the system as a whole. Today, Deputy Presiding Officer, I am pleased to update the Chamber on how we are delivering the commitment to develop and publish new evaluation and improvement arrangements for the entire education system. The arrangement has four integrated strands, which will apply equally to schools, regional consortia and the Welsh Government. These are self-evaluation, peer review and validation, evaluation indicators and the publication of an action plan. As in many of the best performing education systems in the world, robust and continuous self-evaluation self provides the mechanism to improve. The OECD and ESTIN are working with practitioners to design a self-evaluation framework which will ensure coherence, criteria and a common language for self-evaluation across schools, local authorities, consortia, ESTIN and the Welsh Government. Schools will be required to self-evaluate across a number of areas, such as their impact on pupils' attainment and on their well-being, the breadth of the curriculum, their capacity to improve, and their effectiveness to collaborate with other schools. The main purpose of our approach to self-evaluation is to identify areas of success and failure, where good practice can be shared, and importantly, where failure can be urgently addressed. I'm also clear that the self-evaluation process must require an external perspective if it is to benefit from the necessary challenge needed. And therefore, it's our intention that all schools will have their self-evaluation validated. The school self-evaluation will be discussed with consortia on an annual basis to determine what level of support the school requires or the level of support it can provide to other schools. And furthermore, it's hoped that this self-evaluation will then be validated by ESTIN as part of their new inspection process. Importantly, as a school's self-evaluation will be expected to be peer-reviewed by other schools, this will help us to develop our culture of partnership and school-to-school -school support, while also building capacity across clusters, clusters of schools so that they can gradually take more responsibility for their own development. I won't preempt the outcome from, from developments that the OECD, ESTIN and the profession are working on. However, I do expect schools of self-evaluation to be wide-ranging, impl including important areas such as the quality of leadership in a school, the quality of teaching and learning, the well-being of pupils, as well as how schools are supporting the four purposes of the curriculum, amongst other areas. This will give us a lot more information about how a school is operating, above and beyond the simple level two inclusive score that for too long has masked performance of too many cohorts of our pupils for, uh, in our secondary sector in particular. In terms of the visibility of this information, the outcome of self-evaluation and validation will feature in a three-year school development plan it is our intention that all schools will publish a summary of its school development plan in order to share that information with parents and with the wider community. This is about providing a more intelligent set of evaluation and improvement arrangements, and I'm confident that the peer review and validation process will do this. As I mentioned earlier, these arrangements will also apply to other tiers of the system too. I will expect regional consortia to self-evaluate against their agreed business plan and go through an annual peer review with other consortia. The outcome of the self-evaluation will be the development of a three-year action plan, which will be subject to scrutiny and sign-off as part of existing government's arrangements, as outlined in the National Model for Regional Working, with ESTIN 
validating the self-evaluation. Consortia will be expected to publish a summary of, of its action plans annually to share information with its constituent local authorities and schools. Finally, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I hope members of this chamber will welcome this, at a national level, Welsh Government will also self-evaluate against the objectives and actions within our national mission and generate a self-evaluation report. The self-evaluation report will be peer-reviewed by members of the Atlantic Rim Collaboratory, which includes leading education systems such as Finland, Ireland and states and provinces in North America. I intend to publish a summary of the self-evaluation and action plan in the form of a Wales education report by the end of this year. And I will further update members on this work in the coming months. Thank you. Susie Davis. Uh, can I just say welcome uh, for this? Uh, I definitely welcome this statement. Um, anything that uh, speaks to improvement and the visibility of the improvement in standards is something I'm, I'm sure we all want to hear a little bit more about. Um, perhaps I could just ask you uh, to, uh, to kick off with, um, uh, you say that we're going to get an update on this again when the learning and, uh, oh, sorry, the curriculum areas of learning and experience are going to be uh, published, which I think is due for April next year. Um, can you tell us if that's broadly right, and in which case, how difficult it's going to be for the peer um, uh, uh, review work that you mentioned at the end of your statement there to be produced by the end of the year? It doesn't seem to give them an awful lot of time to uh, get to grips with this new system. Um, I welcome in particular as well the acknowledgement of the unintended but arguably foreseeable consequences of the existing system which had been over-focusing on that CD boundary and early entry, both of which were matters we raised in the uh, debate last week. Um, in that debate, we also challenged the assertion that comparisons in standards couldn't be made year on year because in that case we were talking about qualifications. Uh, but we, we said that you still can compare because the qualifications uh, a Wales reporter told us that standards were stable. What I'm after, I think, is some assurance that this, the change in this system won't make it difficult uh, for us to compare findings on improvement or failure uh, to improve in what is to come and what has already been. I mean, you've already know about our concerns about recategorisation, possibly disguising some uh, failures to improve. And as we've heard with ambulance waiting times, changing rules as a just disguised and increasingly worrying constituents experience and we want to avoid us being in that position with these changes which as I say uh, on the face of it look very welcome and we do have a duty to scrutinize you um, and I know I'm new in this post at the moment but I'm finding it difficult to find points of comparison between the system we have at the moment <coughs> and the changes you give us an indication of in your May written statement so obviously I hope to get better at comparing but um, if you can give us some as I say some assurance that uh, we're going to be able to see uh, uh, comparables uh, between the system and the previous. Uh, will the evaluation um, include um, the effect of emphasis on academic subjects of a good quality vocational offers? Now, I, I raised this again in the uh, debate last week, um, where we saw that the drop in the number of entries by weaker students for, for A-levels obviously improved the statistics for A-levels, whereas an increase in numbers going for GCSE sciences saw an overall drop in the percentage of A to C achievements. So part of this change is to better evaluate uh, the quality of leadership. And as school management is one of the reasons we had a, a rack of warning notices um, in the, also referred to in last week's debate. Can you tell us that if school leaders on a per pupil basis decide a pupil is better equipped, if you like, to go for a vocational subject rather than an academic subject, or examination, sorry, that this won't affect their school evaluation? Uh, statistics because good leadership is about getting the best out of every pupil and of course academic subjects aren't for everybody. Uh, I'm pleased to see that the evaluation applies to regional consortia and indeed Welsh Government. Uh, Self-evaluation of course may be a characteristic of best practice but it does come with its own risks and I seem to remember that the OECD report going back a couple of years now identified that schools in Wales tended to be rather over generous with themselves when it came to self-evaluation of their performance on discipline so I absolutely welcome uh, this idea of peer review and uh, particularly the, the final comments in your statement. But can I ask whether it allows for an element of, well I've got cross-pollination written down here, but what I mean by that is will schools in, in evaluating themselves be allowed to comment on their relationships uh, with uh, school consortia, with schools challenge, even local authorities, 
maybe even Welsh Government, because these are all relationships which should lead to better school standards. So I'd like them to have the freedom to be honest about those relationships, and similarly for those other bodies to have uh, the freedom to be honest about the relationships with certain schools as well. Uh, and then finally, you mentioned visibility, and um, or maybe comprehensibility is what I'm more interested in, because you know that old world of school families and court tiles may genuinely may as well have been an inkling on as far as families were concerned. Um, so even though the OECD may have suggested that assessment of pupil performance is about identifying their strengths and weaknesses in order to help them improve, I think it's realistic to expect families to want to understand how schools as a whole are performing as well. So how will you be establishing what information matters to families and how that information will be included in the summary of the school development plan? And I'm just wondering, I mean, it's, is there any space perhaps for some guidance on that uh, to run alongside the, the new evaluation indicators? Because the quality of communications between schools and families is something that's worth evaluating in my view. Um, maybe not necessarily as part of this, but if there's some way we can incorporate that into what we're looking at uh, in the future, that would be really helpful. Thank you. Uh, could I uh, thank Susie Davis uh, for uh, those questions? And Deputy Presiding Officer, uh, she does herself a disservice by uh, focusing on the fact that she is uh, new to the job. I think the points that you've raised are, are really relevant uh, and thank important you. things that we need to discuss. Um, if I could just go through them uh, as comprehensively as I can, I, I think there is um, what the member uh, conflates is the assessment and evaluation framework, which will be published in the springtime. That is part of our work on the developing the new curriculum. Uh, what we need to do as we develop the new curriculum is not just focus on content, although clearly that is very, very important, but actually how are we going to measure individual children's progress against that content? Um, members will be aware, and sometimes they raise with me the issues around Scotland. I think one of the lessons we have learned from the Scottish experience is that they tried to bolt on assessment and evaluation after they had dealt with con uh, content. We're trying to do that uh, at the same time so that there is a clear understanding. What we're talking about here is the self-evaluation of individual schools' performance, which is a slightly different uh, thing. The, the whole purpose is to increase uh, visibility and to provide more information uh, to those that uh, are, are interested so that the school itself can reflect uh, on its own performance, where it needs to improve, where it's doing well and what progress it uh, can uh, make. And the member quite rightly said, is there a danger of, this, of people marking their own homework and choosing what they want to, to, want to be evaluated on? One of the problems that uh, the OECD identified with the current system of self-evaluation, because it does happen in school, is that there is no national approach. There are various toolkits, there are various methods of doing it. And one of the things that we're announcing, you know, I'm clarifying today, is that there will be a national approach, a shared understanding of how each school will do this so that there is a coherence across the whole system so that we can improve upon what has happened uh, to date. And also, as she rightly identified, making sure that that applies throughout the whole, uh, throughout the whole uh, system. Uh, I appreciate that because we're changing systems around accountability, uh, that that pr does provide a challenge with year-on-year -year comparisons. But what we're doing, I believe, is moving to a system of more intelligent uh, accountability measures in our schools that, <coughs> that I believe will drive the right kind of behaviours. The member quite rightly talked about parity of esteem between academic and more vocational qualifications and school leaders making the right decision for each pupil. I would argue that under the old regime, we had incentivised perhaps school leaders playing the system that made the school look better than actually thinking about what was right in, in the needs for each individual child. And that's why one of the matters that will be considered as part of the self-evaluation, although I don't want to preempt the work that the OEC is doing, because the OEC, the ESTIN and the profession are developing this evaluation framework. We're not doing it on our own. We have international oversight. 
will be to look at the breadth of the curriculum, actually what is on offer so that our school system does meet the needs of a variety of learners and understands that uh, you know, that comes from a breadth of curriculum and a breadth of offer. And of course, the member will be aware we've already moved away in our level, away from level two inclusive performance measure for secondary schools to a cap point score, which means every pupil counts. Uh, in the past, if you concentrated on your CD borderlines and got them over the edge, actually that's what drove behaviours in school. Under the new system, every single child will count. What they do will count. This will mean that every child matters and they deserve the equal attention of, uh, of, of their school uh, staff. Uh, I take your point about relationships with the families. After the quality of teaching, we know that a parental engagement in their child's education is the second biggest factor will affect how that child does. So good working relationships between families uh, is absolutely crucial uh, and, uh, and I understand that that is being part of the assessment that is being looked at at, at the moment. And uh, cross-pollination is exactly what we want from this process of getting schools to work more closely together and schools and regional consortia uh, uh, and ESTA more closely together so we get better at sharing of practice. One of my constant frustrations in the system is we have excellent world-leading practice in some Welsh schools and it surely it can't be beyond the wit of us to ensure that that is consistently implied in all of our schools and part of this process is all about making sure that schools are working collaboratively together that'll be part of the evaluation am I working with my other schools I have a responsibility yes to my children but I also have a responsibility to the cluster and to, to the nation and also, that summary, that summary of the evaluation will be available to parents. At the moment, the information is really limited available to parents, so this is about giving greater visibility to parents uh, beyond, beyond just what's available at, at the moment. Can I just, just a bit disabuse the member for, of one thing? There is a difference between assessment and accountability. We have to get back to the system where assessment is used for the purposes of learning and for driving a child's educational journey. Assessment should never be about systems of accountability because if you cross those over, that's where you get gaming in the system. That's where you don't get a true picture of what is going on. So there is a difference between assessment, which we want to drive learning in our schools. Assessment is the, is the bridge between teaching and learning. And we can't have that being caught up in a, an accountability regime. Accountability stands separate, and that's what we're developing. Assessment for robust, uh, robust assessment measures to drive teaching and learning in our schools, but also robust accountability measures by which individual schools, regional consortia, and the government can be held to account. Diolch y gai ddiolch i'r ysgrifennydd am ei datganiad a croesawu y datganiad hefyd yn amlwg byddwn ni eisiau gweld y fframwaith a'r manylion pan fydd e ar gael ond dwi'n sicr yn cynnogi i'r cyfeiriad i chi'n symud tuag ato fe. Ac yn aml iawn i ni'n anghofio sicr yn y blynyddoedd a fi felly bod angen ymfiriad yn yr athrawon yn fwy felly nag i ni wedi wneud yn y, yn y gorffennol ac uh, wedi dweud hyn yn gydestyn adnabod gallu plant a potensial plant i, 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 i weld cynnydd ac yn y blaen a, a dwi'n meddwl bod yr un y gwyddor uh, yn berthnasol fy'n hyn. Hynny yw symud i hunan werthuso i hunan asesu. Mae plai Cymru wedi hyn alw am system hunan wella lle mae'r proffesiwn yn gyfrifol am ei sefonau hunan, uh, ond lle mae'n ar gwrs framwaith asesu a werthuso gref uh, yn ista uh, y tu ôl i hynny. Mi ddwedwch chi uh, mewn uh, datganiad mis medi dwetha, byddwch chi yn cyhoeddi uh, y framwaith newydd uh, i'r system addysg yn ei gyfanrwydd uh, yn ystod yr hydref eleni. Uh, yn amlwg heddi, nawr eich chi'n cadarhau uh, y byddwch chi'n gwneud hynny uh, y flwyddyn nesaf. Eich chi wedi cyffwrdd ar hyn mewn ateblyn oron, ond yn ei jyst yn ei deall pam roedi. Um, chi gyfeirio at y ffaith bod chi felly yn cyplysu'r broses yma gyda chyflwyno y cwricwlwm, a mae yna rwy'n yn deall y rhesymeg y tu ôl i hynny, ond felly chi mor pryd felly fydd hwn yn llawn weithredol ar draws Cymru, beth yw'ch nod chi os safbwyn pryd y bydd y fframwaith yma yn gwbl weithredol ac y bydd pawb o fewn yn gyfyn drefnaddysg yn y tebol iddo fe, fyddai ni'n falch i glywed hynny. Um, I chi'n sôn eich datganiad y bydd disgwyl uh, hunan werthuso ar draws nifer o feisydd gwahanol uh, sy'n edrych ar gyflawniad a lles uh, y disgyblion uh, ystod y cwricwlwm sydd ar gael y capacity wella uh, 
gweithio gyda ysgolion eraill ac yn y blaen, a mae hynny i gyd, wrth gwrs, yn, yn agweddau i'w canmol ac i'w hannog. Ond sut y bydd hynny'n cael ei ystyried yng nghydestyn yr amrywiaeth sy'n awadnoddau ar gael i ysgolion? Oherwydd ma, chi'n meddwl, mae'n anghysondeb, hyn i'n chwilio am cysondeb yn yr asesu, ond mae'n anghysondeb yn yr adnoddau sydd ar gael i gyflawni er enghraifft yr ystod o gricilwm sydd ar gael. Uh, mewn rhai i ardaloedd, chi'n meddwl, mae'n gallu debau gwell neu gilydd, uh, a mae hynny'n mynd i gael effaith uniongyrchol ar y pynciau mae ysgolion yn gallu eu cynnig. Felly, dwi jyst yn teimlo tra bod yr egwyddorion yna uh, yn bwysig, a bod ni'n gallu cael system gydlynnus cohirant, dwi'n credu chi'n dweud, gyson ar draws Cymru, uh, mae'r cydestyn, wrth gwrs, yn amrywio un ardal i llall, a felly bod hynny yn, uh, yn mynd i greu rhyw fath o wrth daro fewn y system. Um, chi hefyd yn, yn berffaith iawn i ddweud bod angen annog uh, a hwyluso uh, rhannu arfer dda, um, ond eto un o'r pethau ni'n glywed gan y sector naml iawn i bod yna ddim mor lle a ddim mor capacity ar slac os licio chi fewn y system i rhyddhau aelodau staff i fynd i sôn am yr arfer da ma sy'n digwydd a mae hynny rhaid yn cael ei gydnabod uh, yn yr adnoddau ychwanegol i chi'n rhoi i'r ysgolion arloesu. Uh, er mwyn rhyddhau uh, a thrawon i fynd i siarad mewn cynadleddau ac i siarad o'u profiad. Felly, chi mae'r os na adnoddau ychwanegol ar gael i ysgolion uh, er mwyn gweithredu uh, elfennau uh, o'r fframweth uh, yma neu ydych chi'n rhaid gweld felly bod yna rhyw arian uh, transisional ar gyfer symud o un cyfundrem uh, i'r llall, fydde ni falch iawn i glywed beth yw'r sefyllfa uh, yn hynny o beth. Mae'n hyfryd gweld y bydd y consortia a Llywodraeth Cymru yn y tebol i fframweithiau cyfatebol. Uh, dwi'n meddwl bod hynny'n anfon neges bwysig uh, i a thrawon ac i'r uh, sector gyfan. Bod pawb nid yn unig yn tynnu'r un cyfeiriad, uh, ond bod pawb hefyd yn y tebol ac yn chwarae yr un rheolau. Um, a, a bod ein cyflwyno elfen o gydraddoldeb sydd yn neges positif uh, uh, yn y marn ni. Um, Byddwn ni hefyd yn gofyn os na fwriad i beilota hwn um, ar y ffas lo oherwydd yn amlwg. Chi'n mod i ni gyd na fyddus i weld ni'n symud i'r cyfeiriad yna, ond mae'n bwysig bod e, uh, os oedd i'w endigwydd, uh, bod e'n cael ei wneud uh, yn iawn. I chi'n sôn am yr angen i osgoi unintended consequences i chi'n dweud uh, a cyflwyno um, approach um, coherent yn i'w cyson ar draws Cymru uh, wel mae'n debyg y byddai elfen o beilota felly yn rhan o'i gyflwyniadau uh, yn, cyfran, yn gyfraniad pwysig i hynny rhywbeth. Uh, can I uh, thank Llyr uh, for his welcome in the direction uh, of uh, travel? Uh, I'm sure we both have been reading and studying the same um, research and evidence about the power of self-evaluation in driving improvement and the power of a self-improving school system. If we look at international best practice in high-performing countries, uh, um, uh, trust in the profession, uh, but also a, system, a strong system of self-evaluation and school-to-school -school working is crucial uh, in driving an education system uh, forward. Unfortunately, perhaps in some of the ways in which we have had accountab accountability measures in the past, it has worked against that principle of schools sharing good practice. If, you know, if I'm in a quartile, I, I need somebody else to be doing worse than me. So why would I share with you my approaches that are working well for me? So actually, uh, you know, in, in the past, we have had a system of accountability that perhaps unintentionally has worked against this principle of schools working closely together uh, and, uh, and raising standards uh, collectively, which, as I said, we, we know from international evidence is a strong driver for change in an education uh, system. Uh, with regards to uh, timescales and to the important uh, point that Lear made about testing, we will be testing this uh, uh, in, in the new year, in 2019. You're absolutely right. Well, we need to understand, if the government pulls this lever, what does that mean on a day-to-day -day basis uh, in our schools? And we don't want to uh, create a new set of unintended consequences by the changes uh, that we are, are, are making. So it will be tested. Uh, initially, at the moment, we're sharing some of the thinking with our primary school sector uh, on how it will work in the primary school sector. And we will continue. Uh, and what's important to to note here is that this self-evaluation tool is being developed uh, in conjunction 
uh, with, with the OECD, so that we have that international rigour and oversight, uh, with ESTIN, who will have the job of validating a school self-evaluation uh, self regime, and with the profession itself, so that we know that we're coming up with a system that is workable in the school. Because the worst thing that we could do is design a system that actually is not practical for a school to, to, to use and to help them drive improvement. So, um, so the profession is involved in the development of it. But I also think it's important, uh, I, and I take your point, that individual schools and local authorities make different types of funding decisions, but I do think we need to have a shared understanding uh, across the system about what we mean by self-evaluation, and we're looking at the same factors uh, in, in each of our schools. And again, the things that we would ex be expecting to see delivered as part of the framework would be its effectiveness as a learning organisation, how are you demonstrating how you can move things forward, the effectiveness of its, its school improvement processes, crucially, on the impact on the pupils. Why are we doing this? What's, what's the point of doing any of this if your improvement isn't going to lead to better uh, outcomes and more positive impact on your school pupils? Uh, progress and achievement around the curriculum itself, clearly, uh, but, also looking at, but also looking at the issue of well-being. You know, we've had many debates in this chamber recently about the need for a whole school uh, uh, approach. Uh, we have to have a more sophisticated way about how we hold schools to account for the issue of well-being. At its worst, well-being is about have the children turned up. And if they have, well, there we are, we're addressing well-being. You know, we know from the work that the committee has done, we have to be much more sophisticated mm -hmm. at looking at how we address well-being. We need a whole school approach. And we also know that schools do what they will be evaluated on. So this has to be an important part of the self-evaluation framework as we, as we go forward. You're right, one of the challenges here is creating time for all of this to happen. In the first instance, you correctly identified we are providing resources uh, for, for, uh, for pioneer for pioneer schools to be able to undertake this work. We will be looking to resource new professional development learning opportunities that facilitate people going uh, to and from uh, different uh, schools. So th this will be need to be resourced. And in the longer term, that's why we commissioned Mick Waters to do the report that you yourself mentioned earlier on into, in leaders to the que uh, questions to the Leader of the House, because that talks about how we can begin to think about how we can make these things a possibility in the constraints of a very busy working life for a teacher. Uh, and I will be looking to respond fully to that report once we've had the opportunity to digest everything that's within it. But I, I was very heartened that, uh, that you found uh, it a very interesting and stimulating uh, read, and that provides a blueprint for how some of these issues can be addressed in the longer term in a more sustainable way, rather than constantly having to put pots of money together to uh, make these things happen. Michelle Brown. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and thank you for your statement, Cabinet Secretary. Self-evaluation is an important internal exercise, uh, but when used in this context, where it will form part of a larger evaluation and assessment process, and where schools operate under a funding model that sees schools competing for pupils, will the self-evaluation of schools and consortia simply end up being an exercise in self-promotion? Now, I know you say that the self-evaluation will be validated externally, but if that is the case, um, if it will be subject to um, external validation and evaluation, why bother with the self-evaluation in the first place and not just leave the matter to external bodies such as Estin? And from a practical point of view, um, what will validation mean in reality and how will Estin actually go about validating self-evaluations of, uh, of, of consortia and, and schools? Uh, I would be really, really interested to hear what you, how you foresee that working Cabinet Secretary. The uh, schools should already be self-evaluating for their own use, so this idea that the evaluation should become public, in a sense, will surely risk what previously might have been an honest evaluation, becoming one spun in order to attract more pupils. Is this really the correct move, considering the funding model? And would the Cabinet Secretary favour a changed funding model that would suit this evaluation scheme better? Turning to the peer review of both schools and regional consortia self-evaluations, how do you foresee that working in practice? What's the intended output of the, output of the peer review? And given that both regional consortia and schools will be effectively checking each other's homework, 
How can you ensure that standards will be improved as a result? Thank you. Uh, I believe that there is a huge uh, amount of value uh, to be placed on uh, a, uh, an internal exercise that looks at the strengths, the weaknesses uh, of an individual institution and, more importantly, what steps are going to be taken uh, to make that institution uh, better. Uh, we know from all the international uh, evidence and research that schools as learning organisations are a feature of high-performing education systems, and that's what I want for the children uh, of Wales. But we also know it does have self-evaluation uh, does need to be have an element of peer review. Uh, that's why we will have schools working uh, together to provide that. Not only does it provide an excellent opportunity to verify um, an internal exercise, it promotes the spirit of collaboration between our schools, something that we have not been good at in our system in the past and we need to improve upon. And that was one of the features of the OECD report into the Welsh education uh, system. Uh, the validation will be carried out by ESTIN. Now, the member says maybe we should just leave all of this uh, to ESTIN, but realistically, the inspection cycle would leave you know, huge gaps when ESTIN would be able to get to a school. This will be an annual process uh, that will be undertaken. Uh, and therefore, we can have real life time. One of the problems of our current inspection system is that uh, a school can go many, many, many years before Esting comes back to inspect that school again. And, you know, uh, for, for, for better or for worse, an inspection report can become out of date quite quickly. I know schools that have moved immeasurably in a short period of time. I also, uh, you know, we have schools that have done uh, well. There's lots of evidence of this across the border in England, where a school has done well after inspection, but actually performance and standards drop immediately because the threat of an inspection report uh, isn't due for, another, for, for years, uh, you know, years and years' uh, time. So actually this gives us a much better and a much more robust system where these things are being constantly uh, looked at and challenged. I have no plans to change the current model of education uh, funding, but of course I will look at every opportunity to maximise school budgets and maximise the amount of uh, investment that the Welsh Government can put into our education system. Thank you very much, uh, Cabinet Secretary. Item four on our agenda this afternoon is a statement by the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Social Services, the <coughs> Autism Updated Delivery Plan and Autism Code of Practice. And I call on the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Social Services, Vaughan Gethin. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. It is widely acknowledged that autism services are improving, but I am acutely aware that many autistic people and their families still face a daily struggle to access the support that they need. I understand that services must not only continue on this improvement trajectory, but do so at increased pace. That is why today I published an updated Autistic Spectrum Disorder Strategy Delivery Plan. The revised plan reflects important new commitments to improve services. These new commitments reflect feedback we and our partners have heard from autistic people, their families, carers, and wider stakeholders. And the commitments include issuing a code of practice on the delivery of autism services under the Social Services and Wellbeing Wales Act and the NHS Act 2006. Issuing a code of practice on the additional learning needs and Education Tribunal Act 2018 and to roll out the new ALN system from 2020. Updating and expanding Welsh Government Autism Advisements of autism guidance for housing providers, improving data collection through developing GT autism registers, consulting on making autism a standalone theme for future population need assessments, raising awareness by improving engagement and involvement of autistic people in policy development, and expanding the independent evaluation to look at the alignment between children's neurodevelopmental neuro and wider autism services and to address the continuing barriers to reducing diagnostic waiting times. I want to say more today about my intentions for the statutory code of practice on the delivery of autism services, which I have already committed to publish within this National Assembly term. 
This code will set up how local authorities, health boards and their partners should have services available to meet the identified needs of autistic people and their families and carers. In November, I will issue a public consultation to gather views on where we need to focus the autism code. The code will have a significant influence on where and how local authorities and health boards prioritise resources and how they actually deliver autism services. We need to get the balance right between requiring certain outcomes and at the same time enabling continuing innovation. The consultation document will reflect the feedback that has already been received from stakeholders, including our ASD advisory group and professionals working to provide autism services. As I reflect on individuals' experiences of struggling to get the support they need, I particularly want to hear more from autistic people, their parents, carers and wider family, about what they want to see in a code of practice that will make a practical difference in their daily lives. We also want to hear more from those who deliver support, who will be able to advise on current practice to tell us where improvements should be made. We also want to know if there are any unintended consequences which could arise because of any guidance that we choose to put in place. The consultation document will focus on five key areas and will seek to capture many of the issues that are set out in the Autism Bill, which I believe can be addressed without the need for the legislation proposed in the Autism Wales Bill currently beginning scrutiny. And these are assessment and diagnosis, accessing care and support, staff training, planning, and stakeholder engagement in service planning and delivery. <coughs> the consultation would ask for feedback on where our plans could unintentionally cause harm to existing services and impede the successful delivery of the ASD Strategic Action Plan, particularly the National Integrated Autism Service. For example, we plan to maintain the 26-week ass assessment waiting time standard for children and expand this into adult services. We do not think it is wise to change these arrangements as our tested approach will enable service providers to organise and deliver timely first assessment appointments rather than just to signal that assessment has commenced which is as proposed in the Autism Bill. Our approach will help to ensure there remain sufficient resources to provide a post-diagnostic service. I think there is little to be gained by focusing hard-pressed resources on funnelling individuals through assessment at the cost of providing care further down the line when it is most needed. The code when published will reinforce the duties already placed on local health boards and local authorities to provide autism assessment services, setting out guidance on the arrangements and the scope of service provision. It will highlight the need for compliance with nationally agreed diagnostic pathways, which have already been published, and by encouraging named lead roles to ensure services are regularly reviewed and reflect up-to-date practice. There will also be guidance on how autistic people should be able to access care and support services based on their needs and made accessible through adapted practice. That should reflect existing duties in social care legislation. In recent years, we have also made significant progress in raising awareness of autism among services and across the community. And we want to do more by asking services to undertake a training need assessment for all of their staff and then to provide training identified as suitable for their role and experience. The National Autism Framework for Wales is already available as a tool to undertake this work. The Code will also provide additional guidance for regional partnership boards in relation to service planning and existing duties to undertake a population needs assessment. We will make autism a mandatory standard and core theme for future assessments. This will ensure that regions have clear plans in place to deliver and monitor autism services. And lastly, but perhaps most importantly, the new guidance will set up the steps which should be taken to ensure that autistic people, their families and carers are engaged in planning activity and involved in service development. In developing the code, I will of course take account of the work being undertaken on the Assembly Member-led Autism Wales Bill that has recently been introduced. As the Health and Social Services and Sport Committee gather evidence on the proposed legislation over the next few months, I will, of course, be listening. I'll be attending committee and presenting written evidence. However, it does remain my view that the bill is not the right answer to improve services for people in the context of the range of service developments that are or will be put in place. In the context of all the actions I've set out today, the potential legislation 
being discussed in the Assembly will not, I believe, provide us with new tools to improve services. It would, though, I believe, install a rigid set of requirements which are likely to do harm to the improvement trajectory that we have put our services on. I do not, it will not result in more money being put into the system. It will result in existing resources being used less effectively. I believe we are on the right path. Rather than change course now, we need to get on with delivery, including through taking the steps I have outlined today. And I do hope that colleagues across parties can get behind our plan, and as a result, that outcomes for autistic people, their families and carers will continue to improve. Thank you, Mark Isherwood. Well, in your statement, you say that the Autism uh, Code of Practice will set out how local authorities, health boards and partners should have services available. What do you mean by should and what use is should, given that should never delivers anything? You refer to a public consultation, but you know that the uh, design of the integrated autism service was supposed to adopt co-productive approaches. So how do you respond to the findings of the interim independent evaluation of, of the autism strategy and integrated autism service um, that although the co-productive approach involving staff, service users and carers and the design, implementation and evaluation of the IAS was required, there were concerns about the top-down approach which had stifled this. And I can assure you, I've spent much of the summer working with distressed autistic people and their families who tell me it ain't getting better. How do you, in terms of your consultation, or how are you ensuring that this um, puts the onus on the service provider or on government to identify the communication needs and communication environments of autistic people? We're simply sending them or giving them information about a consultation will not enable access for many and will actually act as a barrier for them. You refer to assessment and diagnosis. Uh, how, do you refer, uh, or how do you respond to a situation I've encountered, you know, obviously in my case, in North Wales, where uh, a, a private diagnoser, a clinical a consultant psychologist and a multidisciplinary team are being commissioned by the health board to assess and diagnose, uh, but their private assessments um, where people have been refused uh, assessment of diagnosis, often because girls have been so effective at masking in school, have been refused by the same health board um, on the repeated claim that they apply different standards, which has been shown to be factually uh, untrue, where exactly the same process is applied uh, in both circumstances. How do you refer to the statement by the National Statistics Society that a code of practice alone will not go far enough to address the needs of the autistic community, where the London School of Economics warned in its 2017 Autism Dividend Report that without legislation there would be little ability to require public bodies to implement government initiatives in full, and it doesn't provide statutory permanence in the way an Autism Act uh, would. How do you respond to the concern, which has also, been, I know, been expressed to you, because I've been copied on some of this correspondence, about the lack of numbers being picked up by the integrated service and the lack of services from the service to pick up slack from third sector bodies that are progressively losing support? I know, I quote from a letter to you, 11th of August, regarding the one-stop shop uh, offered by the Autism and Spectrum Connections Cymru uh, in Cardiff, which is now cutting down on their services from September uh, due, to, due to lack of funding. As this person told you, it acts as a safe space in the community for autistic people like them, um, and it has supported over 740 autistic people between 2015 and 2018. The IAS signpost people to services, and yet the services that the autistic community themselves state they rely on are progressively disappearing. The uh, Cardiff um, uh, and Vale Integrated Autism Service, uh, in fact, according to Cardiff uh, Youth Council, does not offer a drop-in service for autistic adults and only offers a telephone consultation and support for autistic adults, their carers or parents. Again, a failure to assess the communication needs of autistic people and therefore gauge what real experience uh, they're actually uh, happen, having. How do you respond, given that Flintshire County Council is hosting the IAS in North Wales, to this email I received last weekend on behalf of a peer advocate group of autistic people? 
uh, a draft letter which they said shows that autistic individuals and families are repeatedly being failed and then when complaints are made, no one is held accountable for failures. Or one last weekend from a 12-year-old child, one of many who had initially been refused assessment because she was so effective at masking, she wrote to the same council and she said last weekend, after her draft statement had been shown to her, I found many points to be incorrect, some put to much extreme. I'm 12, currently unable to attend school for many reasons. I'm unhappy with the report and feel no one has listened to the information we provided because nobody established her communication needs uh, first. And another one here to the same organisation. Many of us struggle with meeting strangers, especially in alien places. We struggle to communicate our needs effectively by phone, in writing and email. We've been unable to obtain effective advocacy on ours and our children's behalves, despite us detailing our processing difficulties. It often takes us a long time to post information verbally or in writing without support to understand and interpret correctly, despite many of us appearing very articulate. When they contacted the new IAS, they were sent forms to fill in, which put many of them into meltdown. They were then told that they couldn't fill in the forms, they should come into a drop-in centre at a specified location to meet unknown people, which showed that the people who sent this had no understanding of autism, autism autistic people or their communication uh, needs. I have to, I'll jump on and just conclude by asking how you could, uh, respond to the article uh, in the Institute of Welsh Affairs um, uh, website recently by the External Affairs Manager for the National Autistic Society, Cymru. She said that their recent survey found that nearly half of autistic adults cited a lack of professional understanding as a barrier to accessing support. It's clear existing legislation is not enough to reduce the significant barriers autistic people face. She said the bill, the autism bill, is an opportunity to provide autistic people with a level playing field where someone can access the support they need without being bounced between other statutory services such as those designed for people with a mental health condition or learning disability. So let's ask what the consequences of inaction would be on the 34,000 autistic people across Wales and their families. But the challenge for anyone still to be convinced that this legislation is needed will be to listen to the views and experiences of those people and offer a solution that commands their support and makes a meaningful and tangible difference to their lives. So hopefully you will hear that call and in so doing, perhaps you could just conclude by telling us how again you will ensure that your government, your services and the IAS actually start establishing the communication needs of the autistic community and individuals within it in Wales before it starts drawing at conclusions and making recommendations to you. Yeah. Thank the member for the series of comments and questions with and I think there are essentially um, three broad themes there. The first is about communications and I recognise that there is a challenge about uh, effectively not just communicating to but with people uh, that is common to many of our challenges across health and social care, particularly in this area though. Uh, the second broad challenge I think is that a number of the points that you make are uh, about the North Wales service, uh, so within the examples that you gave and of course that is a, uh, the rollout of the integrated autism service only began this summer within North Wales. So I would not expect to see uh, a, a significant uh, consistency to have taken place there yet or a significant story of service improvement that is making a real tangible difference that people feel and can experience themselves in North Wales yet. Uh, I think it is right that we judge the success of the service uh, once people have actually taken part in it in significant number. But there are lessons to learn as we look to uh, continue and complete the rollout of the service and it is important that we understand where things don't go well. That's part of the whole point about service delivery and improvement. Uh, on the discrete issue you raise about uh, diagnosis, uh, I obviously can't, uh, I can't deal with that. I'm not able to comment on the particular points uh, that you make, but if you want to write to me with the detail, uh, then I'm happy to make sure that those matters are properly looked at. I think the third broad point that runs through what uh, run through your own uh, series of comments and questions, is uh, to make the case for legislation. And there is an honest disagreement about this. I would uh, honestly say to him and other proponents of legislation that if you look at what has happened in England, 
you cannot plot the chart of both service improvement and outcome improvement for people with autism. So I think there's a challenge about suggesting that legislation will cure the challenges that we all recognise across this chamber uh, that affect people with autism and their family. And I think autistic people are looking for an answer that will practically help to improve uh, their current life and their prospects for the future. Uh, and I do think that trying to suggest that the autism community have a single view on this uh, is not borne out by the facts. Autistic people have engaged in the consultation and the conversation thus far, uh, and it is not uh, true to say that there is a single or overwhelming view. If you look at where the integrated autism service has rolled up with a period of time, there are a range of testimonials from staff within the service who believe they are doing a better job and have more time to do a better job, as well indeed as autistic people themselves who have engaged and have been listened to to make sure that their individual needs are properly taken account of. Service redesign and is never unanimously supported. Uh, and I think it's important for all of us who want to see services reformed in any area to recognise that. So there will, of course, be criticism. People who don't support what's being done, people who recognise their individual experience isn't good enough. And I don't try to avoid that at all, uh, but I really don't uh, accept the rather doomsday uh, uh, pronouncements that the member makes about what is being done and why. I look forward to further evidence on the rollout of the Integrated Autism Service. I look forward to people engaging uh, openly and honestly with the uh, suggestions that have been made today and indeed the consultation that will come out in November this year. Um, diolch, uh, my right date, my uh, Saul Elven or Dasganiad, Danny Weddy uh, Egal, uh, Gandochi uh, Heavy and Positive, uh, and then we're here then on Doom Heavy, my friends in uh, Buisigu Govia, the Ibordno and Olog Sauer of Bolan, can we see and Sertion Ver or Hena Sagali that Pari Drui that Vorias Benodol? Um, Dachi drwy eich uh, y ffordd ych chi'n ymwneud â hyn yn sôn am ddiagnosis a gwasanaethau cefnogi uniongyrchol fel yr pethau pwysig. Wrth gwrs, mae yna lawer mwy na hynny iddi hi, um, a dyna pam dwi'n meddwl bod angen deddfwriaeth. Da ni'n sôn am yr angen i gael gwared ar rwystra i bobl autistig, rhag gallu uh, chwarae rhan llawn mewn uh, cymdeithas. Uh, mae angen rhoi rhagor o amddiffyniad i bobl uh, efo ASD yn erbyn penderfyniadau sy'n cael eu gwneud uh, sydd ddim yn cymryd i ystyriaeth uh, niwro wahaniaeth. Um, mae o yn ymwneud a o bosib newid arferion recrutio uh, er enghraifft. Mae o yn uh, yn golygu sylweddoli bod penderfyniadau uh, ynglyn â phob matha o, uh, o feysydd o wasanaeth cyhoeddus yn gallu cael effaith ddofn iawn ar bobl sydd ag awtistiaethau. Er enghraifft, mi glywais i am yr effaith mae newid neu uh, dynnu gwasanaethau tyrnidiaeth i ysgol yn ei gael ar blant uh, efo ASD. Um, uh, mae'r newidiadau yn gallu cael effaith ddofn ar blentyn autistig, rond ydy uh, tyrnidiaeth ysgol ddim yn wasanaeth uh, i bobl autistiaeth, ond mae penderfyniadau ynglyn â hynny yn gallu cael effaith uh, ddofn. Cwpl o gwestiynau um, cyffredinol me mewn difri. Um, mi ydych chi yn deud eich hun bod y cod ydych chi eisiau ddatblygu yn mynd i allu cael uh, dylanwad sylweddol ydych geiri chi, a'r lle a sut mae awdydoddau lleol a byrddau iechyd yn blaen o'r ieithu adnoddau a sut mae nhw'n darparu gwasanaethau adnoddau. Ond a nhw chi gyfaddau bod um, uh, cael dylanwad sylweddol yn syrthion fer iawn o'r gwaranta fydd yn cael ei uh, cynnig drwy uh, ddeddfwriaeth. Um, a mi ydych chi wrth, wrthod uh, ar hyn o bryd, gobeithio gallu newid eich meddwl chi, wrthod ar hyn o bryd, uh, mynd lawr y llwybr o gernogi'r llwybr o, uh, o gael deddfwriaeth ar wahan. Mi ydych chi'n dweud y byddai deddfwriaeth ar wahan yn gosod um, gofynion rhy llym fydda yn gwneud niwed i yr y, y gwelliant uh, dan i yn ei weld uh, yn eich tîb chi ar hyn o bryd. Ond a newch chi dderbyn? Mae oherwydd bod pobl yn methu a gweld yn bod ni ar lwybr digonol o welliant, yma pobl 
mwy ar rhyw llethol y teulu oedd y bobl sydd ag ASD yn eu bobl autistig yn teimlo bod angen ddeddfwriaeth benodol. Thank you for the um, <coughs> briefer series of comments and questions from the close president from Plaid Cymru. And look, I, I recognise the broad challenge here about legislation or not legislation. Uh, and it's an, it's an honest one as well. You know, I'm not saying that people are engaging in this debate in bad faith. Far from it. Uh, I recognise there is genuine concern across all parties about whether we provide both the right services with the right level of engagement to deliver better outcomes uh, for autistic people, their families and carers. And, I understand perfectly well within my own family as well, so I'm, I really am uh, sensitive to how we properly meet the needs of people who are not getting a good enough deal at present. That's why we put time, energy and effort into improving services with and for autistic people. That's why we put additional money into doing this as well. It's, it's the whole point and purpose of rolling out the integrated autism service. Uh, but I don't think the legislation itself will guarantee that some of those social barriers are overcome. It's about how do we deploy the different tools available to us to do that. Uh, I recognise the challenges that you've set up, but I actually believe that within the integrated awesome service already being rolled out, and our proposals to cover those, including the code, there is real action that should make a real difference uh, to help people deliver against the objectives they have for themselves. And I think they have to be part of a, a, a genuine conversation about how their needs are met to lead to an end point of which they can see their needs being met more effectively too. And I, and I do recognise your point. If people fail to see improvement and don't believe they're being listened to, then I understand why the process of the legislation is attractive. I really do. The challenge is, do we, is it really the case that people feel let down, therefore legislation is the answer, or is it the legislation that's proposed? And equally, I think that what we are doing on really looking to drive improvement, on engaging people uh, uh, directly in the service, both people who deliver those services as well as autistic people themselves. That is generally what we are doing with the money available. And I believe if you look at the testimonials of people engaged in those services, where the integrated autism has already been rolled out, you will see people be positive about it. The challenge comes in the testimonials that I know you hear directly, where people still have, uh, have concerns about the level and the quality of the service as it is, as it is being rolled out on a newer basis in other parts of the country. I still think that legislation is not the answer, and I hope that everyone engaged in examining the, the current bill will look openly about whether, not just whether there is an issue that people care about, but whether legislation is the right answer to help address that issue, make a real and practical difference, and weigh that up against what we are already doing, what I'm setting out today. Uh, and I hope that, as people I do believe generally share the same objective about improving uh, outcomes with and for autistic people, that we will ultimately be able to reach uh, a point of view that all of us can support. Lee Waters. Diolch, uh, thank you, Cabinet Secretary, and thank you for your statement <coughs> and uh, your commitment to putting things into action to improve the lived conditions of families uh, with autism while the whole debate about legislation uh, continues around it. I visited uh, the Serendipity Nursery in Pembrey recently and saw for myself uh, the uh, Learning with Autism Early Years programme, where the Serendipity Nursery is the first in Carmarthenshire to have gone through that uh, programme. And I was very impressed by the way that the experience, not just for the child in that nursery who had autism, but for all the children there, uh, was being attuned. So the whole experience was about making everybody value difference uh, and make small changes to make everybody feel uh, included. And I, was, I thought that was a really palpable example uh, of change uh, at, a, uh, at a grassroots uh, level. Um, I'd be interested to know in the progress in rolling that out uh, across Wales, as I believe it was begin to, due to begin last year through uh, early years uh, and secondary settings. I think the principle is the right one. It now needs to be rolled out uh, at scale. And similarly, I'd like to hear about progress in developing uh, the same programme, Learning with Autism for Further Education uh, and Workplaces, uh, in line with the timetable I believe you had in mind for starting rollout in 2019. Uh, and the National Integrated Autism Service itself, from the conversations I had with those dealing with it uh, at the Chalk Fest, they were very encouraged by uh, the principle of it. Clearly, uh, there's a lot of detail uh, to get right. Uh, it's meant to be in place by March next year, I believe. It's not yet in place uh, in Llanelli, uh, and I'd appreciate an update, uh, please. Uh, 
Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to have the, a direct example from your constituency where that is about uh, making improvements in the here and now. Uh, and indeed, a number of other AMs have uh, spoken to me uh, around the chamber, I won't name them, about challenges they see uh, within their local community and equally uh, progress that they see as well for some people. And it's an important point, I think, to capture what you said about small changes that can make a big difference to people's lived experience. Uh, specifically in your part of Wales, uh, it is the last part of Wales where the Integrated Autumn Service will roll out, the Western Bay and West Wales area, and it is my understanding that it, uh, that it is on track to be operational by March uh, within this financial year, so it is uh, on track to do so. And I think there's an important point about, uh, in the future, me providing more detailed updates to members on what is happening in the assistance provided in a range of other areas of life, in particular about activity around work as well. Because if people are generally going to be included, then actually the importance of work for all of us matters, and it matters for autistic people just as much. So uh, I am keen to want to spell that out about the scale of activity that is taking place and where that is taking place. And equally, if members don't see that taking place uh, within their own communities, I'd be interested to hear from people because I'm in certain areas generally a national role for national improvement in every part of the country. Gareth <coughs> Bennett. And uh, thanks to the Minister uh, for his statement today on a very important subject. We've had um, at least one highly passionate debate um, on this um, in the Chamber, probably more than one um, if you go back a few years. So it's obviously um, a matter that's close to a lot of people's hearts. Uh, now, Minister, you said you wanted support for your new measures from across the Chamber. And I'm sure you would get that support if you could convince us that a new delivery plan and um, a code of conduct would offer a meaningful positive difference to the position of autistic people in Wales today uh, and in the near future. But um, there is a very real difference of, of opinion, as you've uh, alluded to yourself, as to whether or not uh, we, would, we would need legislation to achieve this change. And I do agree with you on one thing, legislation is not in itself um, a panacea. It depends on the quality of the legislation and also, crucially, on, on how that legislation is enforced once it's been passed, because, as we would probably agree, enforcement is the key um, to, um, to making good legislation work. Now, I was glad to hear that you gave some specific dates to uh, Lee Waters um, about the, uh, the rollout of, um, of the new measures. And um, I think that what people want to uh, know is, will, will this make th uh, things get better? And how long will it take before things get better? So if I could just press you on a couple of sp for specific points. Um, access to diagnosis. Are you confident that these measures will improve access to diagnosis? And what's your likely time scale before we can see that kind of improvement? Um, another issue, I think, is training. I think training is going to be fairly key to uh, moving ahead with these measures. Now, you did stress, uh, to a certain extent, the need to upgrade training for people who are likely to be involved with uh, trying to help autistic people. Can you give us... Um, now, you talked about um, organisations needing to assess how well their staff are trained to deal with uh, autistic people. Can you give us any more details on how quickly this rollout of training is likely to progress? Thank you. Yes, on the uh, progress on diagnostics, we've announced already the 26-week waiting time stand that I referred to in my statement. Uh, and we will have, uh, assuming we can get the data right, they'll be published on a regular basis uh, in the Stats Wales. We're committed to having uh, an annual update on measures taken in the Strategic Action Plan and that will also provide uh, the update on training measures uh, to be um, on improvement in training in addition. Akinola, Paul Davis. Uh, thank you, Acting uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm pleased that the Cabinet Secretary has confirmed in his statement today that he has been following my bill with uh, very great uh, interest. And I would urge him, even at this stage, to seriously reconsider the Welsh Government's position and work with me to create the strongest possible autism bill that this institution can uh, develop. There's still time, Cabinet Secretary, for us to work together on a piece of legislation. Now, today's statement has now confirmed the introduction 
of a code which I believe points to the fact that the current strategy clearly is not meeting the needs of the autism community, a step that I believe would not have come about if it were not for the strength of the campaign to bring forward legislation in the first place. And so, does the Cabinet Secretary agree uh, with uh, me and accept that the Welsh Government would not even be considering the introduction of a code if it was not for the proposed autism bill? Indeed, does he also accept that introducing a code is, in, is, is in fact introducing quasi-legislation, given that a code will have some statutory elements? And wouldn't it be better, therefore, if the government just decided to support the introduction of legislation and just support my bill in the first place? Now, the Cabinet Secretary is aware of my view that a code does not go far enough in tackling some of the long-standing issues around service delivery, and it certainly does not offer absolute permanence to the delivery of services, because a code can be revoked at any time. And so perhaps the Cabinet Secretary is now in a position to tell us how introducing a code will tackle uh, this, uh, these sort of uh, issues. Uh, and finally, Acting uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, he states in his statement today that he believes that introducing legislation would result in existing resources being used less effectively. However, surely introducing a code will also involve existing resources being used. So can he tell us what financial impact assessments has been carried out on the potential of introducing uh, this code? In other words, can he tell us how much money will be uh, utilised in introducing this code in the first place? I thank the member for his uh, comments. I am disappointed at the outset of the suggestion that the Government would not be committed to taking action to improve services were it not for the Bill. That is simply not true. Uh, if he had listened to previous debates within this Chamber, he would recognise that in our previous meetings. Uh, it is simply not true to say that without his Bill there would be no code. Uh, there, is a commit there was a commitment given by this Government some time ago to look at a code to try and help provide uh, greater permanence and certainty about what our expectations are for the delivery of services. It would have to, it's simply not a case of uh, a code is so, tra is so transient that it is of no value, I don't accept that at all. We have a number of codes that directly uh, affect service provision and outcomes for people. If any person in the future wished to change the code or revoke it, they would have to positively do so. Uh, the code is already planned in to the work that we have, so we have budgeted for it and expect to not only the process going through consultation, but delivering services. The bill and the model that you propose would direct services in a different direction. It is perfectly reasonable for me to point out to members that using money in a different way would provide different outcomes. Uh, the bill that he proposed, I believe, will be a poor use of resources and take it away from direct service provision. It is a matter for him to make the case for his bill and the money that he wishes to see used and what that actual resource is. It will, of course, be robust scrutiny from people who do still broadly agree that we want to improve services with and for autistic people. We do have an honest disagreement about whether a more rigid path of legislation is the right answer to do so. Uh, uh, Gwythredol Fel yn nodwyd yn y ddogfen. Dwi'n gobeithio bod chi gyd wedi derbyn y bore yma, sef y, y papur yma ymhlith yn cyhoeddiadau diweddaraf o'r adran diwylliant. Mae'r blaenor eitha yma yn cwmpasu pedair thema allweddol. Yn gyntaf, dwi am i ni adeiladu ar y cynnydd gwych da ni wedi wneud yn ystod y blynyddoedd diwethaf wrth o falu am yn sefleoedd a thirweddau hanesyddol unigryw. Yn ail, dwi am sicrhau fod gyda ni'r sgiliau drwy'r sector er mwyn helpu i'w gwarchod yn briodol. Yn drydydd, dwi am helpu pobl i fwynhau a gwertharogi yn safleoedd hanesyddol a'u hannog i gymryd rhan fwy gweithgar ag amlwg yn y broses o efalu am un trwtadaeth. Ac yna, yn olaf ag yn bedwerydd, mae'n safleoedd hanesyddol yn asedau sydd hefyd yn cyfrannu at fiwiogrwydd economaidd Cymru. 
Mae nhw wedi gwneud cyfraniad sy'n ymestyn y tu hwn tu o gwerth i gymdeithas a'n gwybodaeth am y gorffennol. Mae nhw'n gwneud cyfraniad sylweddol a dwristiaeth ac ymdrechion i hyrwyddo Cymru fel lleoliad unigryw i fydsoddi ynddo ac yn arbennig fel lle hynod i ni i gyd i fyw a gweithio ynddo. Fodd bynnag, mae'r themau hyn yn dibynnu ar ei gilydd. Mae angen i sicrhau bod yr ymgyrchedd hanesyddol yn gwneud y cyfraniad mwyad posib at yn llesiant economaidd, ond fedrwn i ddim yn teisio ar werth economaidd ein trymtadaeth os nad yn ein gofalu amdani, ac mae angen talu am hynny. Felly, mae'r sector amgylchedd hanesyddol yn cynnal rôl allweddol yn y gwaith o gyflawni am canion eu hangach Llywodraeth Cymru. Mae'n cyfrannu at themau strategaeth ffyniannus, ffyniant i bawb sydd yn rhan o'n strategaeth gydadlaethol. Dwi helpu i greu cenedl mwy ffyniannus, gweithgar a genedig sy'n dysgu. Mae hefyd yn ategu i'r uchel geisiau a nodi'r yn yn cynllun gweithredu economaidd. Drwy gydnabod y lleoedd ar y benig yma sy'n asgwn cefn economiau lleol ar draws Cymru. Ond yn fwy na dim, y mae yr amgylchedd hanesyddol wrth wraidd yn nodau llesiant a'n hymdeimlad o falchder fel cenedl, beth sydd yn amhosib rhoi pris ar nofyd yn ein tybio. A dod nôl at y thema gyntaf. Y man cychwyn ydy gofalu am yn hamgylchedd hanesyddol. Fe wnaethon ni gyflwyno fel llywodraeth cyn i mi ymuno hi ddeddf yr amgylchedd hanesyddol Cymru 2016 a'r canllawiau a'r rheoliadau cysylltiedig. A dyr i'n cynnal a chadw ac yn gofalu am gan 30 o henebion sydd yng ngofal y llywodraeth. Da ni hefyd yn helpu perchnogion preifat ac ymddiriadolaethau i ofalu am ein asedau pwysig, pyn ei drwy grantiau neu gyngor a carweiniad. At yr ail thema, mae'r broses o ddiogelu a gwarchod yn amgylchedd hanesyddol yn dibynnu ar ddeall dwriaeth o'i briodoleddau arbennig a set o sgiliau crefft cadwraeth penodol. Yr un a wyddys iawn i gefnogi camau i feithryn y ddeall dwriaeth honno a datblygu'r sail sgiliau am arferol. Er mwyn gwneud hyn, bydd yn rhaid prif ffrydio sgiliau crefft trefftadaeth yn y diwydiant adeiladu ehangach ac yn y colicrwm sgiliau ac adeiladu ar yr yngreiftiau sefydledig sydd i'w gweld eisoes o fewn yr cyrsiau meysydd llafur yma. Er mwyn cyflawn i'r drydedd thema, to sori a mwynhau yn ymgylchedd hanesyddol gwerthfawr, dwi am anodd llawer mwy o bobl i ymweld an safleoedd hanesyddol a'i gwneud i'n haws sydd yn nhw i gyd, beth bynnag fo i hanghenion neu galwadau personol i wneud hynny. Mae niferoedd ymweld yn bwysig. Yn ystod 2017 fe ymwelodd dros 1.4 miliwn o bobl a 24 o safleoedd cadw sydd wedi i staffio. Fodd bynnag, mae yna gyfle i ni wneud mwy annog ymwelwyr iau a dwi'n awyddus i weld mwy o weithgareddau'n cael eu cynnal i'r teulu yn henebion cadw a deunydd i hongli diddorol. A dyna i wystyr digwyddiadau difyr megis agor drysfa Gilbert a ffair dreigiau yng Nghastell Carfili, ym resynoldeb yr Aelod Cynulliad Lleol, of course. Roedd yr hyfeddod ar wynebau'r plant ar oedolion yn brofiad llawen iawn ac amrysiadwy i fi. Hefyd mae angen i ni barhau i wella mynediad i'r rhai sydd â chwestiynau a phroblemau yng Nglinas Symud a gwneud hynny mor effeithiol ag y gallwn ni. Dwi'n gobeithio bod rhai o'n chi wedi cael cyfle i weld y pontydd mynediad rhagorol yng Nghastell Cynarfon ac yng Nghastell Harlech. A dwi am weld cynydd sylweddol yn y gwella ar y mynediad 
at lefelau iwch rhai o'n cestyll mewn ffordd sy'n gydnaws a'u cymeriad hanesyddol a heb darfu ar profiad unigryw o fod o fewn henebion o'r math yma. Hefyd wedi gofyn i cadw ail ystyried y canllawiau ar fynediad hawdd i bawd i adeiladau hanesyddol a sicrhau bod nhw'n cyd fynd ar farn a'r safon diweddaraf. Mae mynediad at safleoedd cadw, wrth gwrs yn dechrau ymhell cyn i ymwelwyr gyrraedd y fynedfa. A dwi wedi gofyn am adolygiad o'r ffordd y mae ymwelwyr yn teithio i hynebion cadw yn ystyried ar rwyddion, parcio, llwybrau cerdded, darpariaeth seiclo a hefyd cyd lynu trafnidiaeth gyhoeddus. Mae'r angen i gynnal partneriaethau effeithiol yn sail i lwyddiant y pedair thema rwy wedi amlinellu. Ac yn ystod y blynyddoedd diwethaf, mae llawer o lwyddiannau sector yr amgylchedd hanesyddol wedi bod yn seiliedig ar partneriaethau o'r fath. Gan gynnwys rhai y grŵp penodol sydd yn ymwneud ar amgylchedd hanesyddol a fforwm treftadaeth adeiledig. Ac wrth gwrs yr awdurdodau lleol sy'n mor holl bwysig i ni allu gweithredu yn effeithiol yn yr heng flaen yn lleol. Yn fwy diweddar, mae fforwm addoldau Cymru, a dwi wedi cael y cyfle i fod yn un o'i gyfarfodydd nhw'n weddol diweddar, yn mynd i rafael a'r cwestiwn anodd sydd gyda ni sydd yn aelodau o gymunedau ffydd o wel lleihau cyn i lleidfawydd crefyddol a'r ffaith fod yna nifer cynyddol o gapelu y gyglwysi bellach yn secur a nhwysau wedi bod yn y gorffennol o leia yn ffocws i'w cymunedau. Mae'r bartneriaeth strategol newydd rhwng cadw a'r tri sefydliad trefthadaeth cenedlaethol arall yng Nghymru yn rhoi safle gwirioneddol i rannu sgiliau a phrofiad masnachol sydd i sicrhau refeniw a chyllid a'i gael i mewn i'r gwaith o drefthadaeth. A dwi'n edrych ymlaen at gael adroddiadau rheolaeth ar gynydd yn y cyfeiriad yma. Ar yr un pryd, fel un a fi'n byw yn y Llafgell Genedlaethol bron am rhaid blynyddoedd mewn cyfnod pan rwy'n ceisio bod yn ysgol haig, cyn i mi ddilyn temdasiannau eraill, di hwnna ddim yn y dechganiad swyddogol gyda llaw. Yn dwi am gydnabod cyfraniad y Llafgell Genedlaethol, yr amgueddfa genedlaethol a'r Comisiwn Brynhunol Henebion. Y gwaith y mae'r rhain yn ei gwneud yn ei hawl i hunan ac ansawdd i gwaith a phwysigrwydd yn fy mar ni fel y dadleus i beth amser yn ôl mewn sefyllfa wahanol, ynglyn a'i dyfodol nhw. Mae gwaith unigryw nhw ac ansawdd i gwaith nhw fel cyrff unigol yn bwysig iawn. Dwi ddim am weld y sefydliadau hyn felly yn colli i hynna'n ieithau unigol, ond dwi yn edrych ymlaen at datblygiad trefniadau llywodraethol newydd o fewn cadw. Sefydlu bwrdd mewnol newydd, fydd yn digwydd yn ystod y misoedd nesaf, Mwy o gymorth gweithredol wedyn yn gallu ogi cadw weithredu'n fwy effeithiol ochr yn ochr a'i bartneriad mewn amgylchedd masnachol. A dwi yn dod i ben, dwi'n meddagu ni ddweud. Mae sector yr amgylchedd hanesyddol yn wynebu cyfnod anodd o herwydd bwysari anodd a gan sicrwydd y dyfodol. Mae'r sector wedi maen teithio yn sylweddol fel y gwyddo ni ar gyllu dyr undeb Ewropeaidd dros y blynyddoedd. A mi fydd y broses o ymadael ar undeb Ewropeaidd o nid ag Ewrop ac nid byth a diwylliant Ewrop yn arwain at heriau sylweddol. Ond mae o hefyd yn gyfnod cyffroes. Mae'r ffaith yn bod ni wedi cyflawni cymaint o sylweddol diwethaf yn brawf o'r partneriaethau llwyddiannus mae Llywodraeth Cymru drwy cadw wedi sefydlu gyda ystod eang o'r andeiliaid. Mae yna gyfleg o iawn bellach i'n trefthadaeth ragorol bod yn ganolog i'n llesiant yn y dyfodol. Dyma yw gwraidd yn hynaniaeth diwylliannol fel cenedl, ac hyn sydd yn dweud stori Cymru wrth y byd. Dwi'ch yn bawr. David Meldin. Um, thank you, Acting uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Delighted to make uh, my first contribution as uh, the new Culture and Heritage spokesperson for my 
yeah. party following in the, uh, uh, the great example of, uh, of, of the person now chairing our proceedings. So I, uh, I think that's an elegant link. Uh, and can I say, Minister, that uh, for 12 most distinguished years you sat in that chair and you promoted the uh, concept of uh, constructive challenge. And that's the type of relationship I think that we will now have, and it's one I very uh, much look forward to. I do commend the document. I think it's set up very nicely and well illustrated. I was particularly delighted to see uh, a, a picture in there of uh, Neath Abbey, more specifically the, the way Neath Abbey was adapted after the, the, the terror of the Reformation and uh, nicely modernized by the Tudors into a uh, mansion and residence, uh, which is a reminder of uh, the terrific forces we have in history. But I was born two miles from this uh, uh, site. Uh, most of my family live fairly close to it even to this day. And when I return to Neath, I often go on a walk that takes me down to Neath Abbey along the Tennant Canal. You see the canal there and then the other, other early signs of, uh, uh, of, of industrialization uh, and the copper workings uh, and the abbey. It's a remarkable site. I think it stands comparison almost, almost, it didn't have a romantic void, with Tintin Abbey. Uh, and we should remember we have these sites. That they're already just below the Premier League, but they're enormous uh, value. And I know how, uh, how proud the people of Neath are in Neath Abbey, we don't have such a glorious castle. Uh, our main historical site you know, of, of that antiquity is the Abbey, and I'm delighted to see it uh, uh, illustrated. Um, can I uh, commend your commitment to partnership working? I think in this sector, it is key. The work with volunteers and work with uh, civic groups um, has always been so enormous. In fact, in the 1920s, when uh, uh, the, the remains of Neath Abbey were uh, uh, worked on by you know, a, a great archaeological group, I think, with uh, a mixture of academics and people in, in uh, the, the, the civic societies and just enthusiasts led the way. Um, it's really, really important. And I wonder if you might even go as far as commending the work of Dr. Mark Baker, my uh, uh, colleague, who's a Conservative councillor in, in North Wales, but his commitment to heritage... Uh, is remarkable, and he's been recognised for his work in uh, saving and conserving Gwyrch Castle, um, work he started when he was just uh, 13, and has been recognised by the Prime Minister uh, with a, a special point of light award. I'm not making a partisan point here at all. I'm just saying that it is people uh, you know, with that vision that are, are really key, uh, because they value their local sites and see their true uh, significance, as I have perhaps have indicated with uh, uh, Neath Abbey. Well, talking about Neath Abbey, I'm obviously pleased to see the reference to the Welsh Places uh, of Worship Forum. Um, and uh, you, you referred to this and the, uh, uh, the, the incredible uh, heritage we have with, uh, uh, with chapels. You know, I think something like one a week um, he, uh, opened in the 19th century, 5,000 or more places of worship. One of the great expressions of, uh, uh, of, of the advance of, uh, of, uh, 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 of evangelical uh, 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 Christian faith. Uh, and it's something we should be you know, proud of. Obviously, most people don't have an attachment to that type of uh, for Christianity <laughs> anymore, but it, it was really, really important. And can I commend, now that I don't serve uh, the area of Neath, uh, uh, my political life has been here in South Wales Central, but the Landscapes of Faith project run by the Diocese of Llandaff, I think, uh, should stand out here. And for their participation, a uh, uh, partnership with other organisations such as Coleridge in Wales, and I, I think that shows you the imagination that we really uh, need. Um, it is very, very important that uh, we follow the, uh, the, the aim of their project to champion Wales as an, an internationally important place to discover the heritage of faith and faith, so we could apply that uh, across uh, uh, other areas of uh, historical and cultural uh, interest. I think key here is how we use uh, listed places of worship uh, in order to sustain them. And the most magnificent ones really do need to find a use. And when that use, you know, maybe uh, it could range from a gallery, that's a traditional one, but it may have, you know, be a restaurant, it may be some community uh, uh, centre, uh, a whole range of things. And we do need to protect those buildings, but we need to use them. And I think that is 
uh, uh, key. I was pleased that you referred to the Historic Environment Wales Act 2016, which of course aims to identify and conserve a whole range of important historical uh, sites. Uh, many of these are now being uh, re revealed by new mapping techniques and aerial photography, particularly those relating to the early medieval period, the Iron Age, and even the Neolithic. We are discovering a remarkable number of sites, many of them will be of absolutely uh, uh, international significance, potentially, because of the uh, uh, strength of those early uh, cultures in uh, this part of uh, Western Europe along the seaboard. And I think it's very, very important that we support people, landowners uh, uh, in particular, and, 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 and uh, local councils, wherever these sites are, uh, and, 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 and preserve them, and then obviously interpret them, because some of them will emerge as truly uh, 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 sites of, 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 of first-class importance. Can I just finish by uh, uh, concluding on, on uh, marketing and tourism? As the document says, it's, a, it's, it's a practically a £1 billion industry in Wales. And I, I think you're right to talk about the economic potential and the need for us to have a vision of Wales. And I'm glad that castles are mentioned because uh, um, it is easy for us to see this as the sort of... Uh, 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 the the, the, the Anglo-Norman sort of uh, uh, heavy hand on Wales. But the other side of interpreting that is that was the military investment required to uh, uh, control that area. And it, 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 it is you know, quite a remarkable compliment in, in an odd way. But if we look at Conway Castle, for instance, it does have, I think, the most coherent claim to be the, uh, the, 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 the pinnacle of castle building. At castle building as a fortress uh, ideally suited to its geographical area and for a very, in that case, brutal political purpose. And it's important that when people come to Britain to visit castles, they realise that if they want to see a, what, how a fortress castle worked, and it's nearly in perfect uh, you know, preservation, it's hardly, it's not a ruin, it is, it is as it was built practically, they need to, to go to Conway. And can I conclude by just saying, I think modern technology is a key area here, and that skill is really important. And I would like to hear you specifically on anything that you're doing in the digital cultural sort of projections and, 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 uh, and resources. Uh, the UK government has a specific uh, digital cultural uh, project. I'm sure we're doing something similar, but a bit more information on that would be important because people can see that you know, uh, uh, in, in North America, Australia, whatever, when they're planning their trip, uh, they can then know and have a virtual visit uh, to Conway Castle and then come and see it uh, as it exists. Uh, but, uh, you know, we will work constructively in this very important area to ensure that Wales gets the maximum value for its own uh, citizens, for us all, but also for those who visit us. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, David, for your generous and positive uh, remarks. Uh, I visited uh, Nice and it was a revelation to me uh, to see the way in which uh, the restoration of the Abbey has been achieved. I actually stood there and stared at the <coughs> pointing that had been achieved by those employed by Caddo on the work on that site. But there's also, as my colleague had right after you would remind me, the ironworks, mm -hmm. that whole area around Neath, including the, 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 the canal system, is an area that can, could be developed, I think, although I mustn't say too much, but clearly there are also commercial interests involved who are active in that area uh, with their own businesses. But I'm sure that area could be developed as, as, a, as, a, as a main conservation attraction area for, for visiting uh, tourists. And similarly, uh, I have visited Gwrych. How could I not visit Gwrych Castle? Because I live only uh, 10 miles or so away. And saw the amazing work that uh, Dr. Mark Baker is doing there. Uh, he he, he single-handedly conserved and looked after the old hunting ground of the Prince Llewellyn uh, in, in, within my own area of Dwyfor. Uh, and he uh, is a hugely imaginative person, a great resource for us. And we have, in fact, invested in the beginnings of the maintenance and restoration of Greek Castle. Uh, it, is, it is not a folly. 
it is a unique attempt to reconstruct in the 19th century uh, the, the wonders of the medieval period. And therefore, it is the equivalent, I suppose, going back to my own uh, 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 academic past, of, of, of the romantic literature, romantic literature and poetry in particular. Uh, it is a, a building, as it were, in the tradition of Samuel Taylor Coleridge. And therefore, to, to sustain that and its particular location, visible that is from the A55 and from the main North, North Wales railway line, and, and, and reconstruct it as a, as, as, a, as a tourist attraction, I think, is, is, is a huge opportunity. Um, I'm also pleased to say that I am about to visit the great temple of nonconformity at Morriston. Very welcome. <laughs> uh, and uh, so I think I will, I will keep my ho I will keep my powder dry on castles, uh, on on, on um, <laughs> chapels, until I've had that discussion uh, in Morriston. But I am keen to see what we can do uh, with the chapel heritage. A lot of them have already been converted and have become fine private houses. Some of them have become garages. Some of them are very good garages. All these uses that we have for our religious buildings, I think, are important to recognize. I've also had the great opportunity to visit some of the Neolithic sites. Bryn Cassidy, uh, on uh, that, that site on Anismore, is, uh, is an amazing space. And the work that has been done already to conserve that space by people like uh, Dr. Fionn Reynolds and others in Cadu is, is, uh, is, is a, huge, a huge delight. And we will continue to, to, to invest in that. Now, uh, castles, castles are very special. Because as you so rightly said just now, David, it's, not, it's about the Anglo-Norman inheritance. It's about the government of Wales looking after uh, great military installations which were uh, put up for an ineffective attempt at conquest. And what is equally important to me are the castles of the lords and princes. And that is what we, we are also be promoting. But both, both these are the drama of Welsh history. And if we can convey those to our visitors, and indeed digitally to those who have not yet visited, that is part of the role of government. Because as I said about three times, I think, in this statement, that is our identity and the difference that Wales is in, in the world. And therefore, that's something which, which I feel very strongly about promoting. Thank you. And oh, by the way, my door is always open to opposition spokespersons uh, to come and discuss these matters because the heritage of Wales doesn't just belong to Welsh Government. Dailoid. Uh, as I have a great deal of money, I have a great deal of money, Hanes Ydol, Cymru, a hefyd uh, Chris Awi ymddangosiad y ddogfen yna um, heddiw am um, David Melding wedi cyfeirio at y fe. Eisoes, achos, wrth gwrs, efo y genda yma, mae gyda ni drysor yma, drysor, i'w drysori yn wir. Um, y llai ddechrau trwy Chris Awi, am bellu beth mae'r uh, gwneud o gwneud ei eisoes. Uh, um, I ddechrau, pan ydych chi'n deud, ydych chi'n cydnabod cyfriniadau y mae Llyfgell Genedlaethol Cymru Am Gieddfa Genedlaethol Cymru a Chomisiwn Brenhinol Henebion Cymru yn ei gwneud yn ei rhinweddu hunan ac mae ansawdd ei gwaith wedi creu argraff anoch chi, wedi creu argraff anon ni gyd, os yn un fodlon deud, a dach chi'n bellach yn mynd i mlaen i ddweud nid wyf am weld y sefydliadau hyn yn colli eu hunaniaethau unigol. Clwch, clwch, ddweudw ni, felly dwi'n ychlon gyfer chi ar allu dweud y fath ddatganiad. Dach chi'n mynd i mlaen cyn y diwedd i sôn am yr heriau ariannol i'r sector yma, wrth gwrs, wrth i ni adal Ewrop. A felly, y'r cwestiwn sy'n deillio hynna, wrth gwrs, ydy sut â chi uh, fel y gwnidog uh, yn y fan hyn, yn mynd i sicrhau parhad ariannol, felly, pan mae'r arian Ewropeaidd yn dod i ben. Hynna ni'n cwestiwn penodol, yn wrth gwrs, fel da chi wedi awgrymu mae'r rhan fwyaf o y fan hyn i wneud â hanes cenedl a Cymru, ac angen ehangi y profiad amgylcheddol drwy addysgu 
yn y man a'r lle. Hynny yw, wrth un pobl ni, a'n disgybion i'n plant ni fynd i weld ar yw safle hanesyddol, bod na hefyd rôl addysgiadol yma na yn dysgu'n hanes ni fel cenedl y Cymru. Dwi'n cydnabod â chi di dechrau yn gwirioneddol dros yr haf, rwan wrth danlun elli rôl Cestyll y Cymru, hynny yw fel Castell y Bereg ati, yw cyferbynu efo'r Cestyll arferol dan i'n clywed amdano nhw, Megis, Conwy, Biwmaris, Harlech ac unrhyw gastell gormesol arall da chi eisiau sôn amdano fe. Ond y pwynt sylweddol ydy, yn absenoldeb dysgu hanes ein gwlad ni fel Cymru yn ein hysgolion ni, da ni wedi cael amryw o trafodaethau yn y gorffennol, fyddwn ni'n parhau i gael y trafodaethau yn ysbo. Byddech chi'n cytuno bod un ofynol i ddisgrifiadau yn ein cestyll ni olrain felly hanes dewr y Cymru yn ei brwydr am anibyniaeth a'r ffordd greulon y gyswn ni i gormesu yn aml yn y gorffennol. Achos, wrth gwrs, fel da chi wedi cydnabod eisoes yn ôl pob sôn, mae yna fwy o gestyll i'r filltu'r sgwar yng Nghymru nag i unrhyw wlad arall yn Ewrop. Mi allu ddim na fod yn gryfder o rhan gwerthu'r peth i ni gryw yma, ond hefyd mae'n adlais dwfn o'n hanes yn y gorffennol. Felly, dwi'n crys awe eich gwaith yr haf yma i fod yng Nghastell y Bere, wrth gwrs, Castell y Cymru, yr olaf i ddisgyn i'r saeson, i'r angl normanaidd, os felly ni'n galw nhw fan hyn, mi ddwrthwn nhw'n saeson nes ymlaen, wrth gwrs, ac wrth gwrs cyfraniad Castell Caer Gwrle ac hefyd Castell Criciaeth. Ond yr ham, wrth yn fi mynd i weld un o gestyll y ingl normanaidd, hynny yw Castell Llan Stefan ar y pryd, beth chi'n gael efo'n ydy disgrifiad yn unig o'r manylion yr adeiladwaith. Da chi mae'n cael ddim byd o hanes y lle, na hanes o wlad o gwmpas, na hanes Cymru fer Cenedl, na ddim byd. Da chi'n cael disgrifiadau o sut oedd yr castell ma wedi datblygu dros y canrifoedd, beth oedd uchder y waliau ac yn y blaen lle oedd yn byw lle nes yn nhw symud rhyw ddwy ganrif yn nes ymlaen. Os oedd ddim olrain put o'n hanes ni fel Cenedl yn fan na pam adeiladwyd y castell yna i ormesu y Cymru lleol. Ac wrth gwrs, fel ydw i crobio lle eisoes, da ni erioed wedi clywad cryn dipyn am y Cestyll Mawrion yn y gogledd fel Cynarfon ac Harlech sy'n amgylchynu'r gogledd, geth i adeiladu gan Edward y cyntaf i ormesu'r Cymru. Mae un hyfryd nodi, ddo i y Waen Glyndŵr wneud i farc a rheoli Cymru o Gastell Harlech am rhyw bedair blynedd, nath oedd lwyddo i gael mynediad i'r lle. Dwi'n clodfori ar gwaith ar gael hygyrchedd i gastell harlech y dyddiau hyn, ond wrth gwrs, byr rhywun yna o'r blaen ac yn rheoli cenedl anibynol am rhyw bedair blynedd. Dyna darddiad hanesyddol rhyfelgyrch gwir harlech. Ac achos, sy'n ni'n gobeithio fyddai yr gwneud o gyn gallu cytuno fy fi bod bod yn ymwybodol o'r hanes yma yn gallu osgoi embaras, felly, fel y modrwy hyan bond i grabwyll yng Nghastell Flint y llynedd. Os byddech chi'n gwybod taw Castell Flint oedd y cyntaf i gael ei adeiladu yn y fodrwy ffyrnig hyarnaidd Edward y cyntaf i ladd y Cymru yn y gorffennol, byddech chi ddim wedi dechrau'r ysyniad o feddwl, hmm, gwn i fodrwy hyar a ddechrau yn i o yng Nghastell Flint i fe? Jyst symud ymlaen, mae diogelu yn hamgylchedd hanesyddol yn bendant, dwi'n credu yn golygu diogelu ein henwa lleol hanesyddol traddodiadol hefyd. Da ni wedi clywed am ddigon o enghreifftiau, fel cwm cneifion yn yr yrru yn dod yn nemles cwm a mae'n y ddwsinau o enghreifftiau tebyg sawl enwau newydd Saesneg yn disodlu yr enwau Cymraeg hanesyddol. Felly, ydy'r gwneud o gan dal i gredu i fod o yn iawn i bleidleisio yn erbyn fy mesur i i ddiogelu enwau hanesyddol y llynedd, ac o gofio da ni'n dal i dderbyn eu siamplau eleni o golli enwau hanesyddol. Oes ganddo unrhyw fwriad i rhoi diogelwch cyfreithiol i arbed ac i ddiogelu ein henwau hanesyddol. Wedi'r cwbl, mae planigion prin yn cael ei diogelu yn gyfreithiol, beth am amddiffyn ein henwa traddodiadol sy'n ein diffinio ni fel Cymru. 
ac yn ôl adio yn ymwybodol o amser, neu droi at y fforwm addoldau Cymru, a rhyw'n falch i weld cyfeiriad at hwnna, ac hefyd yn falch i allu dathlu y gwaith maen nhw'n wneud. Dwi'n siarad fel ysgrifennydd capel biwiog yn Abertawe, ac i jyst i gadanhau bod na hanes cyfeithog fel dan i ni clwad gyda'n capelli anheglwysi yma yng Nghymru hefyd. Wedi'r cwbl fel blwys yn ei gan David efo anghyd ffurfiaeth ar ei anterth bu i un capel Cymraeg newydd gael i agor bob deg diwrnod yn y ddegawd 1880. Yn y ddegawd yn ei un capel newydd bob deg diwrnod. Ac mae'n bosib olrhain hanes Cristnogaeth yng Nghymru o amser y rhyfenid ymlaen drwy fynd i'n hen y glwysi a wedyn ein capelli ac hefyd edrych ar ein hadfeilion Cristnogol. Fel dwi wedi dweud eisiau os efallai chi wedi cyfeirio, mae yna waith clodwyw yn cael ei wneud yn y maes. Ond y lle ofyn os fyddi wrth y gwneudog ehangu ar y gwaith benigedig sydd ymlaen ac gweld sydd fydd y gwahanol cynlluniau yn datblygu achos mae'n wir i ni fod yn cloriannu ac yn clodfori hanes crefyddol ein gwlad hefyd. Diolch yn fawr. Mae'n diolch yn fawr i dai am y sylfadau yna. Gai ddechrau drwy ddweud, dwi ddim yn ymni heiro am roed Llyn Capel Tegid y Bala, lle roedd wedi weddau rhanwyl fam yn yn ddiacones, yn flaen ores, fel sy'n gyda'r hengorff am lynyddoedd, a'r ydydalen yna. Oherwydd mae'r etifeddiaeth, ag eid ffurfiol, o'r etifeddiaeth capelli yn allweddol bwysig fel y cyfeirio dau. A dyna pam dwi ddim am sôn gormon am hynna heddiw, achos mae'n hyfarfod i efo hi'w Trigelus Williams yn rhefforus yn fian, a dwi yn gobeithio gallwn ni gynnig rhyw fath o gynllun penodol mewn cysylltiad ar gweithgaredd gyda y fforwm ffydd y gallwn ni gynnig datrysiad i'r sicr i'r adeiladau hanesyddol gwarchodedig, ond hefyd i ddefnydd o tifeddiaeth ffydd fel rhan o ddi allduriaeth y Cymru ym mhob cenhedlaeth. Ond dwi am ddweud gair am yr mater o enwau lleoedd, Oherwydd beth ydw i wedi sicrhau ydy bod y Comisiwn Henebion wedi cael y cytundeb, a maen nhw wedi cytuno i lunio a chynnal yr hystyr o enwau lleoedd hanesyddol ar yn rhan i fel gwneud ogion Cymru. Ac i mi, mae'r Comisiwn Brenhinol wedi profi i hyn ers cyn diwygiad 1904 i fod yn gorff sydd yn gallu gwneud gwaith effeithiol iawn ar yr amgylchedd diwylliannol ar tirwedd yng Nghymru. Mae yna geiradur amser llawn wedi gyflogi i wella'r hester. Mae'r geiradur yn gallu ateb ymoliadau achodi ymwybyddiaeth ynglyn â pwysigrwydd yn wael lleoedd hanesyddol. A lle mae yna ymgais yn cael ei wneud i newid enwau caeau a lleoedd wrth greu ystadau taim a snachol newydd fel sydd wedi digwydd, nid yn rhy bell o'r adeilad yma, yna y mae'r Comisiwn ar gael i atgoffa datblygwyr fod yna enwau Cymraeg digonol ar gyfer y safleoedd hanesyddol yma. Mae'r canllawiau statudol sydd gyda ni'n cyfarwyddo a wrth yn y lleol a parciau cenedlaethol a chyfoeth naturio Cymru i rhoi ystyriaeth lawn i'r hystyr yma. Ac mae, mae'n dda i gyn i ddweud bod ceiradur yr hystyr wedi bod yn helpu awdur yr alleol yn Sibemro, Cyrffili a Llefydd Eryll i adnabod enwau hanesyddol addas. A drwy swyddogion cadw, mae yna gydweithwedi ar i ddatblygu cysylltiadau cleriach gyda gawrydd yr alleol. A'r sylweddoliad bod enwau Llefydd, yr un mor bwysig i'r Llefydd ac y mae enwau personol i bobl. A dwi ddim yn credu bod pobl yn union cweit wedi deall hynna. Rwy'n dwi ddim am fynd yn ôl chwaith dros cydestun oes y tywysogion ac arthraddodiad tywysogaeth Cymru. Ond un o'r pethau falle bydd dau yn cofio i mi bwysleisio yr i oed bod tywysogaeth Cymru yn boliti. Hynny yw mae hi'n egin wladwriaeth fel y dyfeisiwyd i mae'n debyg gan y wain gwynedd ac fel y dyfeisiwyd 
ar glwyddiaeth wahanol yn ydy heibarth, sydd yn gysylltio at gwrs ar arglwydd rhys. Ac mae diogelu safleoedd yma ar syniad o ddatganoli canoloesol, sydd yn ganolog i'n traddodiad ni fel Cymru. Ac felly mae'r cestyll yma sydd ar sefer arwydd pŵer ar raddaiar, ar arwydd milwrol o'r gwrthdaro yma rhwng dwy boliti, falle os da ni'n galw beth oedd yn perthyn i'r goron neu i'r barwniaid ac i arglwyddi'r mers a beth oedd yn perthyn i dywysocion arglwyddi Cymreig. Mae'r gwrthdaro ynglyn â phwer gwleidyddol yn y modd oedd wedi digwydd yn y canol oesoedd yn rhan o beth oedd yn diffinio ni fel cenedl. Ac mae bodoleth y cestyll yma'n iddyn ni'n unig yng Nghymru, ond ar hyd y mers. A dwi yna weddus iawn i ni edrych ar hanes Cymru a'r mers gyda'i gilydd, fel maen nhw wedi cael ei edrych ar nhw ar hyd y canrifoedd. Ac nid i gweld o'n hermau yn bod ni yng Nghymru yn gwneud un peth, a bod pobl ar ochr arall fel petai yn gwneud beth arall. Ac felly mae datblygu cydweithrediad rhwng yr ardaloedd o harddwch eithriadol yng Nghymru, a'r parciau genedlaethol yng Nghymru, gyda ardaloedd fel ucheldiroedd Sir Amwythig. Mae'r pethau mae'n bwysig iawn i mi er mwyn creu coridorau o ddealltwriaeth hanesyddol ar hyd gororau Cymru. Ond eto, gai bwysleisio bod y gwahoddiad yn y CMSD yn i lefaryddion yr wrthblaid arall yn y lle yma yn y mestyn ni, dwi'n ddweud, yn rhywun gobeithio gallwn ni barhau gyda thrafodaeth adeiladol dros y blaenor eithau yda ni wedi eu creu yn barod fel adran sydd wedi cael eu hadfer i lywodraeth Gymru. Evan David. Rair it is to see a politician of such experience to throw himself into a brief with such youthful enthusiasm which I think is what uh, the Minister has done over the last 10 months and has culminated in this, um, this document. Although I've got to say, I've got a complaint to make uh, in that Wales's largest castle has the smallest picture in the brochure uh, in the form of Caerphilly Castle, um, but you would expect me to make that complaint anyway. It's got to be said, though, the Minister has made up for that by visiting the castle um, on numerous occasions. Um, most recently, you've already mentioned the Dragon's Lair in Gilbert's Maze, which I was there for the launch, and I took my children along. And uh, the minister said in his speech that uh, children's faces lit up when they saw the dragon uh, bellowing smoke. Uh, I've got to say, my 15-month-old daughter, Holly, was uh, terrified um, and burst into tears. Um, but the good news is I took a video of the dragon, and now every time she sees my mobile phone in my hand, she asks to see dragon. Uh, can, can she see a video of the dragon? So um, it really, really did make an impression on her. Um, we need more uh, educational uh, sites uh, uh, like this. But I've got to say, one of the problems with Caerphilly is as you look away from the castle towards the street scene, the street scene could be vastly improved. And I think, to some extent, I think the ministers recognise this. As much as the largest concentric castle in Europe attracts visitors, if you look across the street, some of the... The shape uh, of, of the high street just across the road um, detracts a little from that, and I think further work needs to be done in that area. Um, I've already mentioned the Minister has made uh, and so many visits to Philly, Ca Philly Castle, I've lost count, um, which is good that he has therefore introduced changes to admissions policy, which will make it easier for people to visit um, uh, tourist locations such as this on their doorstep throughout Wales. Um, and it was, indeed was one of the first things that the Minister did um, in office. Uh, there's more to Caerphilly than Caerphilly Castle, of course. Um, it's a rite of passage that the Assembly Member for Caerphilly must mention at some point in their term, Caerphilly Castle and Caerphilly Cheese. Uh, but there is also, of course, Llancaeach Vaur, a 16th century manor house. Um, which was derelict in the early 1980s. And I'm very proud to say my father was chair of the planning committee on Rumley Valley District Council that agreed the renovation and restoration of Atlantic Vaur. Um, and I've no doubt the minister will have visited there, uh, if not, will have plans to visit there. Um, Atlantic is a, a wonderful place to visit, but is also under threat. It's currently council owned and council budgets are reduced. Um, uh, also, I'd say uh, the other area under threat is the National Mining Memorial. 
uh, which the Minister is due to visit next month, which uh, commemorates the tragic 1913 University Colliery disaster. The committee there are not as young as they used to be, and we have concerns that the management of that committee will become more difficult as time goes by. And therefore, I look forward to welcoming the Minister uh, to meet the committee and discuss that at the memorial event to be held next month. Um, there's lots to offer in Caerphilly. Repair a castle I haven't, I haven't touched on. I think there's an opportunity for a heritage, heritage trail there. But within those things I've said, I think I've also demonstrated that there is still work to be done in Caerphilly, and I'm sure the Minister would therefore agree. Uh, thank you very, very much uh, for that, and it's been a pleasure to work with you. And, of course, you're quite right in claiming the credit for, for getting us into action on the review of the local residence pass across Wales. Uh, that took place in the summer of 2017, and as a result of that, there's a new inclusive membership offer, which has replaced the previous pass, giving access to one named site on a regular basis, uh, and therefore the boundary issues that you first raised with me, uh, that we were working on the previous boundaries of previous local authorities, and this was debarring people in terms of the definition of whether they were local residents or not, that's been dealt with. Now, we've had our issues with the silt trap and the sluice gates at Caerphilly Castle o over the years, and uh, uh, CADU does seek to ensure that uh, in working with uh, the engineers of Caerphilly County Borough Council, uh, we ensure that we remove the silt deposits uh, so that the moat is more is regularly cleared of, of litter and debris and so on, and all that activity takes place. We have also commissioned a master plan for Caerphilly Castle that will take into account the potential of new activities in and around the monument. Uh, it is very likely that, that the possibility of using the moat for recreational purposes will be part of the scoping exercise there. So I haven't finished with Caerphilly yet, uh, <laughs> but I think it, it is important that we do recognise that it is a unique site uh, at the southern end of a valley community uh, close to the capital city, and I want to make that uh, an essential visiting site for everyone who is serious about finding out about Wales, because it's the, it's, it's the place to go. So I look forward to carrying on our work in Caerphilly. I'm very grateful for your support. Rydym wedi clywed gan bob plaid sy'n presennol yn y siambr heddi, felly rydym wedi rydig bas o amser, ond mae'n siawns i'r siaradwr ola i ofyn cwestiwn gloi os bosib, Jane Bryant. Uh, thank you for your statement, Minister, and I welcome your words and your genuine enthusiasm for our historic environment. Uh, last week, I had the great privilege of joining you on a visit to the remarkable Newport Transporter Bridge, one of only six bridges still operating in the world today and the best transporter bridge in the world. Um, I know we both had the privilege of uh, driving the uh, gondola across the river, um, something that I will truly uh, remember. Uh, and along with Newport City Council, Friends of Newport Transporter Bridge and Heritage Lottery, I fully support the campaign to help secure the future of the bridge. Opened in 1906, it's a distinctive industrial landmark and a much-loved icon on Newport's skyline. It's a symbol of our question, proud please. industrial Thanks. and maritime heritage. My question is... Um, can we, have, does the Minister agree that more must be done to promote the unique heritage we have in South East Wales, and not just to the tourists, but to local residents and young people everywhere, so that they can enjoy and appreciate our historic sites? Thank you. It was great to be in Newport. Uh, I've spent probably more time in Newport than uh, anywhere else, apart from my own patch of, <laughs> uh, in, in the last few months. But thank you for driving the gondola so much better than the poor minister. This was remarked upon. I won't mention the name, but well, you know who it is who drives the bridge. <laughs> that bridge is driven. It's not just a, an automatic thing. It's a proper uh, living monument. And so, to me, uh, I, I think I said this, this to you on the day, uh, I want to promote industrial heritage as the next phase of what I try and do uh, in my role as, as minister, as long as I have this opportunity. Uh, and I, I think I've done castles. I've done... Uh, a few abbeys. Now I want to do industrial heritage in a much bigger way. And the Blind Avon visit the other day, the Big Pit visit, various things. But the transporter bridge to me, if you'll allow me to borrow it, uh, is, has to be our symbol, our icon of industrial heritage and what it means to us in Wales. Thank you. 
Diolch, Dada, hynny edrych o'r diwn heddiw i ben. Diolch.